Yes. And we are live on YouTube. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Senate Health and Welfare Committee. It is January 28th. Unbelievable. Um, and we have a we have a full day uh, in front of us. And uh, so the, t the goal for today is really just to have a, a very brief in, uh, introduction from some folks who we work with on a regular basis in our committee. And uh, I've asked them to uh, introduce themselves, take five, seven minutes to introduce themselves and maybe highlight a couple of the uh, important issues that are facing them during this session. So to help us understand uh, their concerns. So uh, thank you all committee for being here and we'll try to um, get through this uh, as quickly as we can without losing any of the important information that we wanna hear from people. And we will try to take a break um, maybe around 10, 20, somewhere in that area. So good morning. And thank you all for being here with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. So first on our list, and, and we may deviate from the list a little bit because I know there are some people who have hard stops. I think Jill Olson was one of those. And we'll, so we'll, we'll move to include, put you in um, so you can get to your next meeting. So Devin Green is here. Um, why don't you introduce yourself for the record and we look forward to your testimony. All right, thank you. Devin Green and I'm Vice President of Government Relations at the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Um, we <laughs> represent all of Vermont's hospitals and those are all nonprofit hospitals and I'm gonna throw up a presentation, but don't worry, I will speed through it quickly. <laughs> um, just to give you a little background on our hospitals and what we've been doing during COVID and also our legislative priorities. So let me put this on. Uh, okay. Um, so here is just a geographic visual of where your hospitals are and what type of hospitals Vermont has. We have 15 nonprofit hospitals and two government hospitals. The government hospitals are the VA and then the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Um, within those hospitals, we have eight critical access hospitals and those are hospitals where access to care is prioritized. And so they get a different method of um, a payment essentially, and they have certain, um, certain categories that they have to fit. But this is just a layout of where your hospitals are and what types of hospitals are there. Uh, every once in a while, we hear something like, oh, does Vermont have too many hospitals? Uh, they're just it feels like we have a lot of them. And I want to um, point out that we have a lot fewer hospital beds than comparable states. So within our region, fewer hospital beds. And then um, compared to other states such as Wyoming and um, Washington, DC, we have many fewer beds. So Washington, DC has the same population as Vermont. Uh, and yet they have more hospital beds. Wyoming is, you know, a similar population and also very rural. They seem to have more hospital beds as well. Um, and then even internationally, we have fewer beds than many um, uh, universal healthcare nations. So if you look, we're comparable to Canada um, and then many of the other uh, countries out there that have universal care. Um, despite, you know, having fewer beds and being a rural state, having, or maybe because we're all nonprofit hospitals, we're one of um, five states where there are no for-profit hospitals in the state. Uh, Vermont has uh, uh, lower reimbursements than the surrounding area. So the insurance reimbursements for inpatient hospital services for adults are less expensive than um, our neighboring states. So I do wanna highlight that here, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck, even though we sort of struggle with the fact that we have a very rural state um, and it's hard to efficiently provide care in a rural state. 
One question that came across in the email is what our payer mix is. So we have about 45% uh, public funding with Medicare, Medicaid, and then disproportionate share hospital payments, which are payments from the federal government and the state to make up for uncompensated care that hospitals have to provide where they, um, you know, they have to write off bills or um, forgive uh, payments for people who can't afford care. Um, and then about 55% commercial insurance. One other thing to note with, uh, with all of this is that hospitals pay a provider tax. So we pay a 6% provider tax, which is about the highest amount you can pay. Um, and that provides the state with enough money to fund the Medicaid portion of inpatient hospitals um, and also with about 30 to 40 million left over um, to further use towards Medicaid. So essentially we pay for ourselves with our inpatient um, money. Uh, you also asked about regulation and agency interaction. Uh, we have a bunch of interaction, as you can imagine, with our regulatory agencies. Um, we have the Green Mountain Care Board, where they do an annual hospital budget review, um, where they go over all the hospital budgets, they set the commercial insurance rates, and they um, set the sort of limit for our hospital budgets. We have a certificate of need process, which I think has really helped keep the expenses down in Vermont because it doesn't allow for, you know, all sorts of services to come in. It's a process where if someone wants to provide a new service or do something to their building over a certain amount of money, they have to go to the Green Mountain Care Board and get approval and make sure they have a statewide view and make sure that it would benefit the entire state instead of maybe just that community or just adding more services for adding services. There's also the health resources allocation plan where the Green Mountain Care Board takes information from hospitals, but also from other organizations to try to get a broader look of um, what is happening with the state and the services. And more recently, there's the hospital sustainability plans, which came out uh, from legislation last year where the Green Mountain Care Board will be looking at data from hospitals uh, and uh, other metrics to determine their sustainability and working with hospitals on sustainability plans so that they'll be financially viable going forward. We also work with the Department of Health. Um, that's how we're licensed. Um, they are also in charge of our community health needs assessment, which is both state and federal requirement where hospitals engage with their communities every three years um, to determine what the needs are and set the priorities and really set their mission for the next couple of years um, and what they'll be doing going forward. And then hospital report cards, which are found on the VDH website that have all sorts of quality metrics and information. Uh, we also work with the Department of Mental Health a lot. Um, hospitals provide a variety of mental health services and there's coordination there between people coming into our emergency departments and finding um, services for them at psychiatric inpatient units and other hospitals and moving them around. They're also in charge of designating certain hospitals as inpatient units for psychiatric care. And in general, we're always involved with the Agency of Human Services, particularly right now. We are back and forth with them on the COVID response um, and work with them on Medicaid issues and other things. Uh, beyond state regulation, we also have a lot of federal regulation. We must comply with 629 discrete regulatory requirements across nine domains or offices with the federal government. Uh, we have conditions of participations, and these are things that we need to meet in order to be uh, certified under Medicare and Medicaid. Um, if there is a violation of one of these conditions of participation, the consequence could be as severe as not being in the Medicare or Medicaid program anymore and, and the hospital essentially um, having to close down. So those are very important. And then we also have IRS requirements as nonprofit hospitals that we have to meet where we must be mission-based. Obviously we don't have shareholders, all of our, our um, 
all of the funding we receive is reinvested in the hospital and serving the community. A so Devin, I think um, in terms of time, we're, we're, we're actually out. So it would okay. be helpful. Um, I think your COVID response, we can look through and maybe give a 10,000 foot level of your legislative uh, session priorities. Great. I do want to say the important thing we're doing right now is vaccination. Um, and <laughs> there's we get been it. a lot of work and time on that. <laughs> we'll get it. We understand. Um, and then our priorities are simple. We just want to keep healthcare providers financially stable. Um, there is Act 140. It has regulatory flexibility that we want to ensure still occurs during the pandemic and also with maybe three months of time afterwards for us to readjust to the new normal and then supporting our workforce with uh, tax credits and anything we can do to support the workforce, particularly the interstate nurse licensure compact, which I know this committee has been um, very supportive of. And that's what I have. Thank you, that, that's really good. I think that's, that's an extremely helpful overview and thank you for putting together all the slides because we will refer to those, I think, especially folks who haven't been in committee. Um, we're just gonna keep moving right along and uh, I know we'll see you again, Devin. So thanks for being here. Um, we are gonna go ahead and stick with the agenda for a little bit, move on to Jessa Barnard of the Vermont Medical Society. Good morning. Thank you very Good much morning. for having me. Um, you do have a handout um, that has been posted, but I'll bring it up here as well. I don't know, is that um, sharing correctly now? Welcome That's to the good. Vermont Medical Society. Okay, well, good. great, thank you. So good morning, I'm Jessa Barnard. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Medical Society. We are a physician and physician assistant membership association. We have around 2,400 physician and physician assistants and medical students who are our members. Um, we estimate, we often get the question sort of what proportion does that represent? We think it's about two thirds of practicing physicians and PAs in Vermont. It's a little tricky to, to do an apples to apples comparison, but that's around about our estimate. And um, one of our unique features is that we represent physicians across both specialty, so primary care specialists, um, as well as in all settings. So they could be independent practice, hospital employed, working at FQHCs. So it's a broad, um, membership and that really influences the range of issues we work on and breadth of our um, the issues we we come into the building to talk about uh, i will mention we are the administrative home of some of the specialty societies in the state so for example the pediatricians the family physicians the ophthalmologists the psychiatrists um, we they are their own independent um, organizations with their own boards and membership structure, um, but we are their administrative home and run their their board meetings or their annual meetings and for a number of them provide advocacy as well. And so that gives us a really nice um, connection to those specialties. If your committee has um, a bill or an issue that's more a specific um, substance, or, you know, a specific topic area, we can often help identify experts who can bring that information to you um, or maybe bringing bills to you on specific topics. We also operate uh, the Vermont Practitioner Health Program. I just want to mention this. It's one of our, um, we're very proud of this piece of our work. It's um, a contract with the Board of Medical Practice. So that's the, the body that licenses physicians and PAs in the state. And then there is a surcharge on those license fees. That is then um, we have a contract through the state to run this program to serve licensees with an impaired ability to practice medicine. So individuals can come to us voluntarily or occasionally if there is a licensing issue involved, they may be sent by the board, but we help make sure they have an evaluation and then they're getting treatment and being monitored um, and ideally either main staying in or returning to safe practice to try to keep our workforce um, serving Vermonters in a, in a safe way. So if, uh, please, uh, if you ever want to know more about that program or want the contact information to refer people to that program, let me know. Um, so down at the very bottom here, you'll see our, our staff. So it's myself as executive director. You may see two other folks in your committee, uh, Stephanie Winters, who's our deputy director and actually works with a lot of those specialty societies I mentioned. So 
there's an issue touching on pediatrics or primary care, you may very well be seeing Stephanie. And then Jill Sudhoff Garin is our policy and communications manager, and she works on a lot of our issues as well, especially some of the public health issues. So any one of us, um, you can reach out to us at any time. Uh, we are, so while we have the staff side and then our leadership is physician led, our current president is Simha Ravin, a psychiatrist and um, recently became the chief medical officer at the Howard Center. So we often try to get our, you know, especially if there are issues they're, they're really interested in, um, we want to make sure that our members um, speak to you directly as well. And Simi is uh, very passionate about issues around um, access to mental health services and forensic mental health services. So um, she's a great resource for the committee on those sorts of issues. Um, we thank this committee. Um, I know it's some different membership at the time, but um, this committee um, was very involved with a number of the issues we were working on last session and will continue to prioritize this year. So um, as Devin mentioned for the hospitals, it was also really key for the clinicians of the state to have some of the regulatory flexibilities and funding in response to COVID. So I'm sure we will be back to you hopefully in the not too distant future to talk about extending some of those um, emergency flexibilities in Act 140. That's one of our um, top priorities uh, as well as ensuring the financial stability of our healthcare system uh, as they're responding to COVID. You know, this, this committee and the legislature in general acted very swiftly and effectively to shore up our healthcare providers, um, especially through 2020. And we wanna make sure we, we continue that work for 2021. Um, we also are prioritizing workforce. Uh, last session, the, the legislature funded a one-year primary care scholarship, which we were thrilled to get established and going, um, but we would love to see that sustainably funded on an ongoing basis. It, it um, will provide in-state tuition at the Larner College of Medicine for five third, uh, third year and five fourth year medical students who then commit to coming back to Vermont after they finish their training to serve underserved parts of the state. Uh, so we're, we are thrilled to, it, it's a really unique um, program that we think will help bolster our primary care workforce and get physicians in parts of the state that need that service. Uh, the legislature last year also passed um, in Act 140 also um, a prior authorization provision. So that's the, that's the, the approval that a lot of clinicians need to get before ordering certain services or medications. And it uh, often uh, delays access to care or can be an administrative burden um, on in the day, the workflow of a, of a practice. And so we were really pleased at some of the pieces that were included in one, Act 140. And so this year we'll, we'll really be looking at some of the reports coming back on that, looking at what's called a gold card program, which for those who get their prior authorizations routinely approved at a really high rate, um, they can kind of bypass the prior authorization program. Mm -hmm. So we'll be looking, um, those are the, the really the top issues. We, we work on a lot of public health campaigns. I won't go through all of them, but if you look down at the bottom of this list, it shows you kind of the range of public health issues that our members feel really passionately about from um, reproductive health to tobacco to um, the stem cell bill that you talked about yesterday. So with that, I will wrap up and we look forward to working with your committee this session. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Very good timing on that. Uh, appreciate all the information in a very concise way. And we we have started working on some of the issues that you've mentioned. So thank you, Jessa. And I know we'll see you in committee again. Uh, so we're gonna move right along. And um, Mike Fisher, who is... You just muted yourself, uh, Senator. I'm sorry. <laughs> After Mike, I'm gonna ask Jill Olson to step in because her time is precious today. So Mike, you're up. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here. Um, thanks for taking a little time to hear from all of us. Um, I also am gonna speed through a presentation um, at a very high level. It, this presentation has a, a significant amount of background information that might be interesting to the members um, for you to peruse at your own time. Um, here's the, uh, the, de the details of the presentation. And again, I'm gonna move very fast through it. Um, we've been around since 1999. 
uh, formed by the legislature. We're part of the Healthcare Advocates Office is a part of Vermont Legal Aid. Um, and um, we had significant changes and expansion in 2013 when we changed our name, when the legislature changed our name from the Ombudsman's Office to the Advocate's Office. Here's one of my great advocates, um, Anna Lee. Um, so significantly, I think the, the main thing I wanna to convey to you today is that, that we are a consumer advocate office. Um, you know, I, I'm here today, and, and we're a policy shop, but I'm here today in part to, to remind you about this resource that's available to you uh, on behalf of your constituents and directly to your constituents. Um, we have eight advocates today. We're all working remotely. Uh, and uh, despite some pains in the transition to remote work, um, we're functioning pretty darn well now. We manage about 300 cases a month. And, um, and this service is available to all Vermonters. Uh, there's no income eligibility. Um, so I wanna highlight just very briefly uh, a tool that we built um, that is, uh, we know that people take information in very different ways um, and um, uh, being on the phone and telling us our story directly is always available. Um, but for some people, they wanna do their own research. And so we, uh, Vermont Legal Aid built a tool at your own timeline, take some time to, to look at the tremendous amount of information that's available here. But I'll just speed you through one, um, one scenario. Let's say that you're looking for help uh, paying a medical bill um, and you Google us and you find yourself here. By the way, a lot of people, thousands of people come to these pages. Um, and let's say your, your question is, I don't quite understand why my insurance company didn't pay for this. Um, so you answer those questions and you find yourself on a landing page that has a great deal of information about, uh, about your situation and uh, phone numbers and resources and ways to get help. And always we have our information and an ability to reach us either on the phone or to write down a few sentences and have one of my advocates call you back. Um, so um, it's an important resource available to people. Um, we break our cases into six different categories. Significantly, access to care and eligibility are the major uh, complaints that people call us about. Um, and then the next couple of slides are case examples. And I'm not gonna spend any time on these case examples. Um, some people like to hear about our work through uh, sort of the example of what would happen to an individual. Um, so Phoebe's story, um, um, we, we tell in a couple of slides sort of how we might approach uh, the situation for Phoebe. Uh, take some time to look at it yourself if you're interested. And, um, and Vivian's story, uh, tells a story, it's not terribly uncommon where someone calls us with an individual healthcare problem. This person called us with, um, uh, she didn't understand why when she tried to sign up for Vermont Health Connect, uh, Vermont Health Connect said she'd been on Medicare. She was in her thirties and uh, she'd never been on Medicare. Um, the, the interesting thing is that we had a handful of cases with the same scenario. And so we realized this was, while this came to us as an individual healthcare concern, it was a glitch at Vermont Health Connect. Uh, we contacted them, they identified the glitch and partnered with us to reach out to all the people for whom it had affected. Um, I'll just pause and say, uh, hey, I have an awkward, people ask me all the time how Vermont Health Connect is doing. Um, I have an awkward answer always, it's doing better and better. And yet there continues to be uh, real problems that people bump into um, and, uh, and real need for advocacy for them. Um, we also have a policy team. Um, we live in the weeds, maybe even in the roots of the weeds. <laughs> um, we we um, uh, um, live in a, in a world with some, in some adversarial uh, um, like relationship with some of the other witnesses who are in front of you today on some days and then on other days we partner directly with to um, uh, 
to improve healthcare services. Uh, so the next, um, the next, well, and uh, let me also say, uh, we are at our best when the advocacy team and the policy team working are working hand in hand. Uh, we in the policy team are informed by the cases that come through the advocacy team. And, um, uh, and we often have legislative initiatives that, are, uh, that grow out of the advocacy team's world. Um, the next five slides or so are COVID related program changes from the perspective of the consumer. And um, I'm not gonna spend any time on them. They're available to you if you're interested. Um, and, um, and then I want to take just a moment to show you my, um, my screen. Your schedule uh, doesn't look as busy as mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also provided for you a few do two documents that I just want to flash in front of you. We, if we were in person, you would get this, uh, and it would be uh, it, uh, often green or blue. It is our attempt to put all um, healthcare services on one page, front and back. Uh, again, it is the um, the in the roots <laughs> of the weeds, um, but it is an ability for uh, uh, to have a cheat sheet. Um, if you're interested in understanding um, who's eligible benefits and cost sharing for all of the state um, green Medicare programs. Um, and then I also, just because it's coming up on tax time, I wanna let you show you sort of an example of some uh, of work that we do. Um, nobody describes the Affordable Care Act as a um, uh, tax break, um, but it is for many, many Vermonters. And uh, this is, uh, a communication that we do to tax preparers uh, and to taxpayers um, to remind people that, uh, that they have a tax break available to them, that many of them have a tax break available to them. And so just very briefly, um, if you're an individual on Vermont Health Connect um, and your income is below 400% um, of poverty, um, you have an available tax, uh, tax credit of $3,000. Um, you know, similarly um, for a family of four. And just to remind you, um, for the individual who earns $1 more than $103,000, they lose a little over $12,000 in tax credits. And there are ways to help people um, manage the uh, eligibility for that. And we walk people through that all the time. Um, uh, Mike, I think we're going to have to do a stop at this point. I'm happy to stop. I just will, will say that, um, well, I'm happy to stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And we, uh, we have your slides. And uh, one thing I do want to say, thank you for your two-page uh, in the weeds information. I remember when you said you were making that up and putting it together that will be extremely useful to all of us. And Nellie will have it on, uh, I think she does have it on the webpage. If she doesn't, we should have it there yeah. and we can, we can print it out. And so, so senators, let me just say one sentence. Uh, we are yeah. in, focused on medical debt uh, and its impact on Vermonters. Yeah. And um, we are not focusing on that this year, given all of the pressures on uh, the provider community, but it is a major theme that will be coming at you um, during the session. Yes, I think uh, medical debt is across the board, whether you're a provider or, or a patient. So, thank you, Michael. And I, I know this is a very short period of time for you, but I know uh, we look forward to having you back in committee. All right. So Jill Olson is here from um, some of our long-term care folks. Jill, why don't you introduce yourself and um, go right ahead. Great, thank you. I'm Jill Olson and I'm the Executive Director of the VNAs of Vermont. So we represent the um, home health and hospice agencies. Our association is actually made up of the, all of the, the local independent home health and hospice agencies. So VNA and Hospice of the Southwest Region, for example, Addison County Home Health. Um, as you know, there's also a statewide 
um, Home Health and Hospice Agency, and that's Biata Healthcare, um, they, or Biata Home Health um, and Hospice. They're not actually in our association, but we do collaborate with them on, on matters of policy whenever possible. And I and actually often when I collect data, we do try to collect data from them too, so that we have a picture of the, the entire state. So just to clarify that. Um, I do have just a couple of slides for you um, that I wanted to share. Let's see if I can do that. Okay. Make it into slides. There we go. Oh my goodness. Okay, can you see my slides? Okay. Jill, you're on presenter mode. If you oh, go, am I? Okay. Yeah, so if you go up and, and get it on to um, just the slideshow beginning with the first slide, then we won't have, we won't, you'll, yeah. you'll have a better time. I don't it. know how to do that. Oh, let's go, go up to your, your top little um, dashboard. We're on, on uh, your PowerPoint or keynote, I guess you have. And yeah, I don't it. know what, huh? I'm That's not sure okay. I'm smart. I may not be smart enough. I'm going to have to. <laughs> we'll, we'll deal with it. Go, go right <laughs> yeah. ahead. I, I will figure that out for next time. I'm so sorry. I, I we, no, we, have have it, we have it on our webpage. So go okay. right ahead. Okay. There's, there's actually really only a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, uh, well, first of all, I wanted to just say my time isn't any more precious than anyone else's. Oh, I got it. Wait, I do have to get this off of this uh, presenter mode. Hold on. You know what? I'm going to give up and um, not share my screen <laughs> and just talk to you because you have. These. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we I do have. The well, there it is. Go. There it is. There it is. That's better. well, but that's not on. Um, that's not the slideshow. I know. Mode. Yeah. Well, okay. We'll um, have a tutorial. Yeah. I'm just going to turn it off. <laughs> okay. um, so, <laughs> wow. Well, I, I've made a good impression on all of you. Um, <laughs> I actually am a competent human being. No, you just showed us that you're human. You're just like all of us, Jill. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh my God, my hair is on fire. Um, so there's really only a few things I want you to know. So first okay, of all, good, because provide... you're, you don't want to use up your time. <laughs> no, I don't. We, we provide health care at home. We provide long-term care at home. We provide maternal child health services. We provide end-of-life care. Those are the four big buckets of care. And I think what happens sometimes particularly because many of the things that we talk about inside the state house are only related to long-term care because it's a Medicaid program. It, sometimes it gets lost that we're also providing clinical care at home. So I just always like to emphasize that. We have nurses and therapists going into homes every day. And all through COVID, um, we have taken care of people with COVID in their homes. Um, often we often have a higher census of COVID patients than the hospitals have because people stay with us for so much longer. So um, that's been going on through the through the entire um, crisis. Um, so uh, the other thing I like to remind people is that um, we do about a million visits a year, and it takes about seven million miles of driving to pull that off. And <laughs> yeah, and we have a census of about. Um, uh, 8,500 patients. So a set, that's just a fancy way of saying how many people do we take care of every day? And that's across all of the programs, all of the agencies. So, um, and just to put that in context, hospitals have, I think it's around 800 inpatient beds. So we have about 10 times as many patients on service every day as our inpatient in the hospital. Obviously outpatient service is huge. Um, but just to give you a little bit of context. Um, and then, um, and then the other thing I just like to say is that um, we, similar to hospitals, we are regulated by the state and we are also re regulated by the federal government. So we're about 60% Medicare, that's our primary payer. And then the rest is, um, nearly all of the rest is Medicaid. There's a small amount that is commercial and then fundraising is sort of the, makes up the rest of our revenue. But it's, we are largely Medicare organizations. That means that we are also governed by federal conditions of participation, which are very elaborate and detailed. And then there is a, a very strong system in place for checking up on us on a regular basis and also in response to complaints. So also a really highly regulated industry 
uh, similar to, to hospitals, long-term care facilities and others. Um, in terms of our, um, our priorities, what, <laughs> we've been working really closely th all through COVID with our partners from other organizations. So Devin's slides actually beautifully outlined the priorities that we all have. It's really making sure we have the flexibility we need to respond to the pandemic, and then it's workforce and Medicaid reimbursement. Those are the, those are the big issues for, for us really every year, but um, especially right now. And so um, in terms of uh, state reimbursement, it's largely the Choices for Care program, which is long-term care at home, is the program that does not have regular, uh, any regular methodology for providing increases. And so that program continues to be um, a substantial loss uh, to provide those services, critical services, um, but they're really not funded. So that that's always our, we, we talk about this every year, um, no, different, uh, no different this year. Um, and then I guess the last thing I just wanted to say, well, two things. One, um, home health also pays a provider tax like hospitals, like long-term care facilities, like nursing homes. Um, that's rare, rare, rare in, uh, in this country. Very few states actually impose a provider tax on home health, um, but Vermont does. And while it's great revenue for the state, it's, it's uh, really hard on the bottom line for the, for the agencies who are paying the tax. So I just always like to emphasize that. Um, and then finally, our big COVID response right now is vaccination at home. So we are working every day in really close partnership with EMS to get vaccines out to people's homes. Um, we are, my, the members who are gonna be doing vaccinations directly are ready to go. So there's just some, um, you know, it's mostly about a vaccine supply to get us actually out into the field, but we are working really hard to, to make that happen. And then also to assist our partners at EMS with figuring out who is going to need to be vaccinated at home um, and to really identify those lists. That's gonna actually be quite a lift, I think, to, to make sure those people are, are identified. Mm -hmm. But people who can go to clinics should go there. <laughs> I don't wanna be clear. Um, so that's our, uh, that's our work. And I, between now and my 10 o'clock appointment, I'm gonna figure out how to fix that presenter mode problem so that won't happen again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and could Jill send her slides because I, I don't see them on our- She did. Website. Yeah. yeah, and we'll get them up. Uh, okay, uh, thank, have you. Them yeah. thank you. Oh yeah, my goodness. So that's terrific. Thank you. Um, good luck with your um, PowerPoint. Yeah. Uh, so I, and listen, I just want to say something to the entire committee, and that is during this whole COVID response that we worked on as a committee and that each of the, that uh, Devin Green and, and, and Jill and others, um, I'm sure will reference, Jill has been a real leader in bringing. Jill has been a real leader in bringing um, the, all of the healthcare alliance together and providing some uniformity uh, to their requests. So, Jill, I just wanted to say thank you and let the committee know that the work that you've done. Oh, thank you. And you're I, not I, the I, only one. I understand that, but uh, <laughs> you're, you've been the, the face and the voice. Yeah, I've been glad to do it. I, I I don't think any of us would have survived without all of without the group to uh, to work together. It's been an incredibly collaborative effort, and yeah, it's a great I'm grateful group. to those colleagues. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, oh. Good morning, Senator Cummings. No, I've been here. I just <laughs> wanted to ask Jill, who was struggling with internet connection, did she manage to get better than five one? No. Nope. Okay. No, okay. It's the upload speeds that are killing me, Senator. It's the it's that one that upload. That's why I'm standing in my office presenting to you because there is horrible internet in Middlesex. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Okay. Well, we're going to do the line extension some more. So sign okay. up. Okay. So you just Thanks. used up a whole lot of Laura Pelosi's time <laughs> when she gets here. I will. We'll tell her. There she is. All right. So we're going to move on. Uh, thank you, uh, Jill, and we'll move on to Sean Launder. our long-term care options. And Sean, are you there? I'm here. All oh, right, go right okay. ahead. So um, my name is Sean Lonigan and I'm the state long-term care ombudsman. And I, along with um, five other uh, individuals, uh, ombudsmen make up the Vermont Long-Term Care Ombudsman Project. And uh, prior to this meeting, I submitted um, our legislative report um, the project's legislative report. So that's what I'm, um, I, I guess I'm working off of uh, in discussing and um, presenting about the long-term care uh, project. And um, 
So I just wanted to uh, state that our project uh, are, is a resource um, for individuals that are um, working, uh, excuse me, that are living in long-term care facilities. Um, so that would be nursing homes, residential care homes, assisted living residences, and also individuals who are receiving long-term care Medicaid choices for care in the community. So they're living at home. And so we're advocates and a resource uh, for those individuals. And uh, we do a number of things, but primarily we work with um, individuals receiving long-term care services and supports um, and any concerns they have about the care that they're getting. Um, so a lot of our time is, is spent um, working on those concerns and we can do that informally um, by talking with facilities and staff about issues that residents may be having about their care or we can help um, make um, those individuals make uh, like official or more formal complaints. And that is to the state and uh, survey and certification. So um, that's what we spend um, a big part of our time on. And I should say that Vermont, uh, the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Project is a special project of Vermont Legal Aid. Um, so we are not, um, even though our name is Vermont Long-Term Care, we're not part of state government. Um, we're independent um, from, um, from the state. And, um, and also in our report, so uh, we have ombudsmen throughout the state. So each county has their own ombudsman. And on our report on page uh, 24, it lists um, the five ombudsmen and myself and our contact information. So if individuals um, uh, that, you're, that you're serving have issues about long-term care um, and they wanna talk to someone, um, they can, um, our contact information um, is, is provided in the legislative report. And so and in the report, it lists, um, so you can get an idea of some of the um, work that we've done as far as even though there is COVID, other things are going on in long-term care facilities or issues that people may have who are getting long-term care services and supports. So the report kind of looks at this past year and um, for example, would list the major complaint categories um, for long-term care facilities. So assisted living, residential care homes, nursing homes, and also uh, issues that people are getting choices for care in, in a home, what, what, what they may experience. And we do describe, just to give you an idea of some of the issues that we've worked on. Um, so that would, uh, casework, so it's a little description of, of some of the casework that we've done over the past year, and again, a lot of these things are kind of um, uh, maybe issues or concerns that a lot of us take for granted. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's a good, uh, I, good, uh, good way to get a flavor of some of the issues that ombudsmen um, are working with, uh, with residents. Um, and then uh, I, guess, I guess from your, your perspective, as far as our issues um, and recommendations, um, that's on page 17 of the report. And so during, it just kind of lays out uh, some of the issues that we've seen over the course of the year. So obviously a big issue is COVID cases um, and um, fatalities in long-term care facilities. Um, that's, Vermont has done, um, I, I take, for example, I, I take part in um, nationwide calls with all other state long-term care ombudsmen. Each state has to have a, their own program. And I can tell you, um, that that um, a lot of other states ha have been, have been in, in um, as far as uh, difficulties with COVID, um, there, it's been like eye opening to see those things. But I would say Vermont, the, the, we haven't. Luckily, and it's a reflection of the leadership and also facilities and providers in, in trying to do the best thing. And from my perspective, um, that's that's been happening. And I guess I just want to mention that. Uh, the proportion uh, of cases and deaths um, in Vermont is relative to you know what other other uh, what's happening nationwide. So and again, I have no I, no reason to suspect this, but I I guess our recommendation is obviously that you know COVID um, is a, is a, has to be a, a maintain a, a strong priority. Um, so, so for example, the, the idea that um, long term care facilities are getting vaccinated first is obviously 
um, very important. And, and so we just want to, you know, emphasize that's still an issue and that we shouldn't uh, take our eye off the ball. And then also, as other uh, speakers have mentioned, um, staffing shortages at long-term care facilities and home health agencies, um, that's a, been a big issue and it's just become more exasperated by COVID. Um, so that's an issue that we've seen. And along with the issues, we also list out specific recommendations that we have um, in mind and how to address these issues. And so, you know, at any time I'll, I'll be willing to come back and, and talk about those. And then, so the, a third issue is social isolation and loneliness um, being experienced by persons receiving long-term care services. So um, I'm, I, I'm sure this issue is not new, um, but it's been a difficult time in the sense that trying to balance um, uh, the rights of individuals, and it's really important to have social interaction as we all know, versus trying to um, facilities, trying to maintain um, a safe, uh, safe facility. So it's kind of like the collective versus individual, and it's been a really tough balance to try to uh, do that. And that's you know, um, changed over time in the sense of a strict lockdown in the beginning, then things kind of eased up. And then again, we're kind of like, again, experience a second surge at the you know, end of, uh, of this year. So uh, I guess the only thing that we would wanna mention is that you know, residents um, uh, uh, you know, have, the, they have specific experiences. So in, in thinking about how to go forward, um, again, we're going to defer to the experts in public health, um, but at the same time, it's, I think it's important to hear how these um, like restrictions or how these conditions and facilities and people receiving long-term care, how that's you know how how the, how they feel about that. Um, so, uh, so Sean, I'm 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 sorry to have to interrupt, okay. but I think that uh, your time has actually gone over. Um, okay. If you could just wrap, that would yeah, be helpful. and then the, the last thing would just be quality of care. Um, so again, okay. there's other issues besides COVID. COVID has rightfully um, been a, a main priority. Um, and so those are, uh, we also have some recommendations about um, how, how to address that. Um, so again, I, thank you for the time. I, I apologize for going over. And if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to you know, reach, reach out to me. I'm sure that we'll have you in as we talk about some of the Older Vermonters uh, Act work and others and thank you for your work. And I know that uh, elder abuse and financial security as well as emotional and physical security is, is key for you. And we really respect your emphasis on the, on the patient uh, and the, the people. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so let's let's ask Laura Pelosi. Uh, Laura, if you can make uh, uh, maybe attenuate your comments a little bit, but I think it fits nicely in with um, with this. Absolutely. Good morning, and thank you for having me. My name is Laura Pelosi at MMR, and I'm here this morning uh, representing the Vermont Healthcare Association, which is our trade group for our long-term care facilities. And that includes our skilled nursing facilities, which most of you will um, know as nursing homes, residential care homes and assisted living residences. I do have a unique role for the Vermont Healthcare Association. You know, I think um, for, for those of you who are new to the committee, I represent a lot of different clients, um, certainly in the healthcare space and in the education space, but with respect to the long-term care facilities, uh, I used to be their executive director and I kind of took that job with me when I came over to MMR. So I really am your primary point of contact when it comes to long-term care facility issues. I'm gonna just put up, if I can share my screen. Um, let's see, a quick one pager. Can you see that? No, can you see that? I'm having challenges here. Do you have this on our web page? Yeah, I've got I've pulled it up from your web page. Okay, so why don't we do this? Why don't we let us look at it on our web page yeah. and, and you go go right ahead. I'll just run through it. So this uh this one page there's a lot of information here. Uh, a couple of years ago a legislator asked me, can you get all this stuff on one page? So that's how this was developed. But I won't <laughs> go through it all in detail, but it really kind of describes um some of the differences between the nursing homes and the residential care and assisted living. And it's really a level of care difference. 
One of the things about the nursing homes, they provide health care and long term care. So skilled nursing care, you know, it's short stay Medicare service for somebody who's recovering from a serious illness. Um, you know, that hip replacement, a cardiac event. So they provide a much more acute level of care um, in addition to the sort of more traditional long-term care. And then you'll see here the differences uh, in the level of care across that document. Mm -hmm. We have 37 nursing homes. Uh, that's down from over 40 when I started working with this group in 2009. You'll kind of see the history and the change of, of beds over time and the reduction of beds in the nursing home community. Um, and, and we've got some of uh, the Vermont Veterans Home uh, numbers in here as well. They are a member of the organization. The, the nursing homes are highly, highly regulated like hospitals and home health agencies at both the federal level with CMS as well as the state level. Our residential care homes and assisted living are state regulated entities. I'm not gonna walk through in detail all of the financials. You can look through there and certainly <clears throat> I'm happy to come back and talk about this, but you know, government payer is the biggest source of payment, Medicare and Medicaid. The difference for long-term care facilities from maybe some of what you've heard already this morning is that Medicaid is the biggest payer for a long-term care facility. So our Medicaid rates are really important and they simply do not cover the cost of providing the care. Um, so we need to have an ongoing conversation that's certainly exacerbated the issues in a COVID environment. Um, we've had a lot of financial impact. Vermont has been great about helping facilities get through this really challenging time. And we've had some direct federal um, financial aid as well um, that have gotten us through. But national surveys are telling us that 40 to 60% of long-term care facilities are likely to close by the end of 2021. Uh, the costs have just been enormous as well as the reductions in um, revenue associated with lower admissions. Um, Workforce has been, you know, to Sean's comment, which I really appreciated, as well as Devin and Jill and others before me, workforce has been a terrible challenge. Uh, it was our top issue before the pandemic. Um, the last three years, we've worked really closely with the legislature on workforce related issues to advance some pro workforce policies. Um, so we were really weak on workforce coming into the pandemic. And this has really demonstrated that we were absolutely right about that and that we need to continue every effort to try to address um, the workforce shortages, particularly in the area of nursing. You'll see some of that workforce data down here. That was from 2019. It doesn't reflect um, COVID. And I can, I can assure you that that traveling nurse number for the nursing homes um, at this point is probably three to four times that $12 million number. Um, it's an extraordinary cost to try to bring traveling nurses in from other places. And then you'll just see here um, some of the challenging populations that um, we're trying to serve in the areas of dementia and Alzheimer's, substance abuse, and those with mental health needs are particularly challenging in a COVID environment. And as you all know, um, you know, I'll just echo a little bit of what Sean said, you know, they've been under tremendous pressure in terms of changes to visitation, quarantine requirements, testing requirements, vaccine deployment, PPE supplies. Um, so I'm happy to talk to you at any point about any of those things, but they're facing a lot of challenges and we need to focus on, um, you know, retaining where we are, but then also recovery. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Terenzini has his hand up. Uh, we weren't gonna have questions, but Josh, is this uh, something you can ask quickly? It, it just yeah, thank you, Senator Lentz. Just be really quick. Uh, uh, Laura, did you say, did I catch correctly, you said 40 to 60% of facilities are are estimated to be closed by the end of the year? That's a national, based on a national survey, yeah. And I can tell you, you know, our census in the nursing homes has dropped dramatically. As of last week, we're at about a 76% census. And for facilities that are below 90% occupancy, they get a hit on their Medicaid rate. Um, so that's a real, um, it's been an issue for a while. We've seen census decline, but it's been an issue. So, you know, we're hopeful that with um, the great job that our state has done providing some financial assistance, as well as the federal funding coming in that we can weather the storm. Um, but we've always expected that um, this would be an ongoing issue for long-term care facilities for a couple of years. Thank you. I, I, thank I, you. And Senator Lyons, we'll have an opportunity later to ask more questions. Uh, perhaps not today, but we'll try. It just our, this was really an introduction. 
So okay. as we get into issues and, and we'll we'll talk about how we'd like to, you know, get more information. So we'll work Thank on you. that. Yeah. Um, I'm not meant to close off conversation, but this is really an introduction to folks and I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So um, we have Sarah Teach out uh, here from uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And then we also have Chuck Starrow here from uh, representing MVP. So um, Sarah, it's up to you. Hi, thank you. Um, introduce myself, I'm Sarah Teachout and I am the Director of Government and Media Relations for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, I did ask Nellie <clears throat> if she's there, she can pop up my slides. Otherwise you can just look at them online and, and we'll talk about it later. Oh, Nellie, you're awesome. <laughs> so go to the next one, please. So just quickly about Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. I know most of you are very familiar with our company. We are a not-for-profit Vermont-only health insurer, um, headquartered in Berlin with about 400 employees whom are all working remotely at this time. Um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont is an independent plan, but we are one of 36 Blues plans nationally. Um, and this means that we can utilize the Blues system to get all of our members access to care across the country. Um, we have about 200,000 members across all types of insurance here in Vermont. And when I say that, I mean comprehensive healthcare insurance marketplaces of which we're probably the only insurance company that operates in all of them here in Vermont. So that means Vermont Health Connect individual and small group, large group, which is large employers over a hundred, um, both the fully insured and the self-funded marketplace. We also offer coverage for federal employees here in Vermont. Um, we have Medigap plans, that's the sort of term for the wrap plans for Medicare, as well as Medicare Advantage, which is a new marketplace for us. Um, I, I won't get a lot into regulatory issues, but uh, each of those marketplaces has a different regulatory structure. Um, and we are regulated by a lot of different entities here in Vermont, um, the Green Mountain Care Board, the Department of Financial Regulation, um, the Department of Vermont Health Access, among others. So, but it's split among uh, the different marketplaces. If we could go to the next slide. Um, I realized when I wrote our 2021 priorities, I didn't even write COVID on here because I believe that runs through every single thing that we're working on right now. Um, and I will say that the focus currently is the rollout of the vaccinations, um, which You've heard a lot from the providers. Blue Cross also plays a large role in that. We are providing data and tracking um, vaccinations for the Vermont Department of Health um, by population. Um, we are providing clinical and administrative staff to the vaccine sites, um, as well as um, working on PR and information campaign campaign about vaccinations for our members. So that's in addition to these priorities. Um, none of this should be new to you. Um, we are focused on pharmaceutical prices because they are, continue to be the main driver behind um, premium costs here in the state of Vermont and nationally. Um, we are collaborating on the all payer, payer model effort with the state and working towards a value-based payment system. And we could spend days talking about that alone. Um, Blue Cross is really working towards cost containment by focusing on low value care. And I can spend some more time talking about examples of what we see as low value care that um, Vermonters really shouldn't be spending their money on. Um, we are working with Dr. Avelia to support her um, efforts to eliminate healthcare disparities, um, particularly around language barriers, but there's other things that she's working on. And then COVID has really highlighted for us um, that we need to advocate for our members, um, access to high quality care, timeliness of care and patient choice are really the, the issues and the efforts that we're focusing on um, for our members. So the next slide after this, um, we get asked all the time about health insurance premiums. Um, health insurance premiums mirror the cost of care in Vermont and nationally. Um, and so this is for the Vermont Health Connect plans, but it's roughly the same across all marketplaces. Um, the cost of healthcare makes up about just over 90% of premiums. Um, and then the non-cost of healthcare are about 8.2. 
And then the federal and state taxes and fees make up the remainder of healthcare. And I think that comes out to just over 100%. There's some rounding there. So within um, the cost of care, hospital and specialty care makes about 45% of the costs of care. You know, so this is direct healthcare services. Primary care, and I have the 10 to 18% here because it really depends on your definition of primary care. Um, and we've worked on that with the legislature in the past. And then pharmaceuticals make up between 16 and 20% of healthcare costs. Um, and that's retail and in-facility pharmaceuticals. Those are two completely different um, marketplaces, but uh, they are both significant and growing. Um, and then just to give you information about the non-direct um, healthcare costs in insurance premiums, that's about 8.2% for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. We're a market leader in keeping our costs low, um, second lowest among blue plans and very low among all commercial and government providers. Um, administration's about 7.6% of that. And I could go on for a long time about all the things that we do, but I won't, I promise. Um, and then reserves, which you hear quite a bit about are a half a percent generally of premiums and then federal and state taxes and fees, which are a significant piece actually. Um, and so then I don't know how I am on time. I can go into the next slides or not, but I think this is, you know, important information I, to come let, out. Let's mm -hmm. let, let's hold the yeah hold okay. those. You can scroll through and we can scroll through. Um, sure. And um, I know that we're going to get to the telephone only uh, issue probably next week, as early as next week. I don't know when, but um, okay. So let's happy to come back then. <laughs> yes. No, I'm sure you will be. <laughs> it's good. Um, thank you, uh, Sarah. That was a that was a very good. Um, quick and I think almost thorough introduction. We still we missed some slides. Okay, um, Charles St Storo is here representing MVP. So welcome. Morning committee. Thank you very much for having me this morning. My name is Chuck Storo. I'm a lawyer lobbyist with uh, Leonine Public Affairs based in Montpelier. Um, I'm here uh, this morning on behalf of MVP Healthcare. And I should mention at the outset that MVP is a new client of our firm that uh, we were hired uh, late last year. Um, prior to that, you will recall that uh, MVP was ably represented in the Vermont legislature by Susan Grotowski. Uh, Susan retired last fall and uh, we've succeeded her and we're excited to uh, be working uh, on behalf of MVP. I'm gonna try and share my screen. This is the first time out for me, but uh, Nellie was very helpful yesterday in coaching me on that. And let me see if that works. Is that doing anything? Here we go. Can you see? Yep, we have it, we okay. have it. All right, so, um, so at a very high level, uh, MVP is a regional uh, uh, HMO, uh, it's not for profit. It uh, operates in New York, upstate New York and in Vermont. It's headquartered in Schenectady. Uh, they have an office in Williston. Uh, across the two states, uh, they have 700,000 members. Um, and I would just direct your attention to the mission statement um, on this slide that you could review at your leisure. Um, in Vermont, uh, MVP's been licensed as a HMO since 1993, and HMO is a health maintenance organization, essentially a health insurance company that has a contracted network of providers. Um, there's about 40,000 members uh, in Vermont. Uh, most of them are people who are insured through uh, small uh, individual and small group plans. Uh, purchase under the auspices of Vermont Health Connect. Um, it also uh, provides fully insured uh, uh, insurance to large group employers, and it provides um, third-party administrator services for self uh, self-insured uh, employers. And it also offers uh, Medicaid Advantage uh, insurance plans, which are essentially Medicare coverage uh, offered through a health plan. Um, MVP has an extensive network in Vermont of some 5,000 providers, including uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, it is a uh, collaborating, uh, collaborative participant with One Care Vermont and with the Blue Cross, uh, Blueprint for Health. 
Um, is primarily regulated by the Department of Financial Ins uh, Regulation as it is a licensed insurer in Vermont. Um, and its uh, premium rates are uh, governed by the Green Mountain Care Board and um, its activity on the Vermont Health uh, Connect is uh, regulated by the Department of Vermont Health Access, which runs the uh, health exchange. Um, MVP's priority issues for 2021 are to you know, continue to respond to the pandemic um, and to uh, follow through on and abide by the uh, COVID-19 emergency regulations that DFR promulgated last year pursuant to the legislation that the General Assembly passed last year, um, as is the case with Blue Cross Blue Shield. You know, one of its priorities is to uh, try and contain prescription drug costs. It has a variety of tools in which it does that. Um, you know, it, it, it's definitely a priority to maintain the affordability and access to health insurance, and uh, and also to participate in. Uh, payment reform and, and move the uh, healthcare system to a value-based system in that regard. Um, so that's basically a very high level overview. There's my contact information and uh, my contact at uh, MVP, uh, Jordan Eskies. There's his information. And um, I look forward to continuing to work with the committee on issues that re relate to MVP. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck. That was that that was very helpful. Um, and w w there are some questions that have arisen while you while you and, and Sarah were both talking, and we'll we'll get back um, to those questions. I know that Senator Terenzini has some, and I also have jotted some down. So I'm sure others will as well. Um, and we're just going to move right along. And we have with us um, Julie Tesler from Vermont Care Partners. And then after that, we'll go to Susan Risdon and um, Joshua Green. So, and that will get us to some closure. So Julie, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, Julie Tesler, I'm the Executive Director of Vermont Care Partners, the Vermont Council end of it. Simone Rushmire is the other Executive Director of Vermont Care Partners. I guess it could be confusing. Um, I did put something on, or Nelly posted um, some testimony on the um, website, which will give you a link to our website. Uh, Vermont Care Partners represents 16 designated and specialized service agencies in Vermont. There are two other specialized service agencies that we do not represent, Pathways for Housing and Specialized Community Care. Um, the funding and oversight of designated agencies is um, primarily through the Department of Mental Health and through the Department of Aging Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. However, we also have contracts with Department of Children and Families, Corrections, and the Department of Health has eight contracts with our agencies for substance use disorder services. So we also work with the Agency of Human Services as a whole. They uh, work on our grant with us. They work, as you know, on health reform. Um, and we work with DIVA as well. Um, people come to us who are Medicaid enrollees and um, Diva has also been very involved in payment reform, which is great because it keeps it consistent around the Agency of Human Services. Um, we have a really wonderful relationship with all those departments and they've been incredibly supportive during the COVID crisis. So we greatly appreciate it. We're also, um, thanks to this committee in, in uh, large part, um, have the Green Mountain Care Board reviewing our finances right now. Um, we might be the only provider group who thinks that that is a wonderful benefit, but we are very excited about it. Um, it's always complex. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy now. Maybe I won't be happy in the end, but we are. Um, because we are part of the healthcare system and the Green Mountain Care Board has a, a broad purview of the healthcare system and we want them to really understand how we fit in, where we fit in financially. Um, so we're very pleased with that. Um, our funding is almost all state funding and almost all of that is Medicaid funding. Um, so that means we do not, cannot cost shift. We wish we could. So the low payment rates have been a, a huge uh, issue for us. Um, they don't, haven't been increasing with inflation, um, but our costs do. And um, so we do have 
like 1.5% of the people we serve are on Medicare. Some have private insurance. There's some people who pay out of pocket, but generally it's on a sliding fee scale and not very much. And we try to do fundraising, but um, we're not most people's favorite charity, to be honest. Um, so we're really dependent on Medicaid and state funding. And that's why we wanted the Green Matching Care Board involvement. We work uh, really closely with other healthcare providers, with housing providers, parent-child centers, shelters, you name it, because we're providing very comprehensive services in the community for people who have mental health conditions, people with developmental disabilities, and people with substance use disorders. And we're all complex, like nobody kind of fits neatly into a category. Um, and that's one reason we work so closely with other providers. Um, but we're also providing a range of services from prevention and promotion to interventions and crisis services. So it's a, it's a broad array of services in the schools. Um, most of our services are in the community and not in our offices. Um, and there's certainly a great deal of case management services of helping people get what they need in their lives to support them in their lives. So community mental health, you might think therapy, but it's therapy is only a piece of what we do. Um, you'll see on the um, attachment or the, what's posted on the website, uh, an attachment, uh, a link to our, our outcomes report, which we're also gonna be sending hard copy. So if you prefer to read hard copy, it's coming in another week or two. Um, so that can give you some information on what we're doing. Um, our primary expense um, is staffing. Um, and each year that becomes a little more challenging Right now we have nearly 500 staff vacancies out of 5,000 uh, positions. So that's a lot. Um, particularly need more clinicians. Um, we're finding uh, um, nursing is a real issue and um, people provide services in, the, in their homes. Um, so, we, the, so our biggest, our biggest challenge is workforce uh, are below market compensation rates. Um, we have people come and they interview and they're really excited about the jobs. And then we offer them the salary we have to offer and they refuse the job. We've also had a lot of people um, leave service this year. Um, COVID has just added a lot of stress to people in their personal lives and their professional lives. We're telling them they now have to do things electronically and the demands um, have just been too much. So a number of people have retired and so we're having a very hard time replacing them. Um, and yet the biggest thing with COVID, and I, I think I said this last week is this, and we all know this in our lives, it's stressful, it's anxiety producing, there's isolation, uh, substance use is way up, there's overdoses, a lot of alcohol use. Uh, so more people are coming to our doors and even the people that we have been serving over time, we're seeing their acuity levels go way up. And this includes people we serve in developmental disabilities, the isolation, losing their jobs um, and their daily lives, it, it affects everyone. Um, so what do we need? What, what would we like you to do to support us? Well, you can guess, we really need investments in our system of care. Um, and I know that it's hard to make long-term investments given the revenue forecast, but um, I, I guess you, I, I assume you don't want us to crash and burn either. Um, and and you know, it's, we're just at this critical point where we need this investment. Um, we need in developmental services. We need actually clinical staff there now because the, the psychiatric issues of the developmental disability population is increasing. We need more crisis beds for the developmental disability population. More of them are homeless and in crisis. And the transitions of care have gotten harder as we have struggling to uh, find shared living providers. People provide support to people 24 seven in their homes, that 24 seven is getting longer and when people don't have employment and community-based uh, services. Um, on the mental health side, it's the clinicians, um, but we also need nurses. Um, we, all the agencies do have nurses, but we need more nurses uh, because of the complexity of, of what's going on. More crisis intervention, and more residential supports and housing supports. And um, I understand from our folks in the field that Sometimes when they even have a housing voucher for someone, there's nowhere to take it. Um, so it's, and you really can't have health without housing. Um, so Julie, I, I, I don't, I do need to interrupt because okay. we're now moving into the next 
uh, time slot. So, okay. and, and we're a little bit behind, but I think it's really important to hear from folks. And I know that you'll be back in committee. Uh, okay. No question about it. So thank you. And thank, thank you. Sorry for thank going you for sending the four pager. That is extremely helpful. No, it's, it's very good. Uh, it, it'll guide us. Well, thank you for that. And thank, thank you. you for your, for your work. Um, so, and Susan Rizdon is here. Um, so why don't you introduce yourself for the Hi there. Record. My name is Susan Ritson. I'm the executive director of Health First. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I'll try to move quickly because I know we're in the last mile uh, and I will share my screen here. Can you see this? Yes, yes, we're good. Go right ahead. All right, it's not going into the presentation mode. Um, but uh, I'll just run through anyway. Um, so I already said who I am. So Health First is uh, Vermont's Independent Practice Association. So we were formed in the fall of 2010 by a group of independent physicians. And we're a nonprofit taxable organization that's fully financed by member dues and governed by a board of directors. Um, they're all physicians on the board. Our mission is basically to promote uh, and foster the long-term success of independent practices in Vermont. We do things like offer discounts through a group purchasing organization, some really attractive medical malpractice insurance rates. Uh, we fil facilitate networking and conversation between practices to share best practices and um, just, uh, you know, so they can talk to each other about what everybody's doing. Um, we do offer some group contracting with payers. Uh, in this case, we do have a contract with MVP. Um, in the past, we've had a loan repayment program um, to help give uh, folks who applied for the AHEC loan program a little bump in the amounts if they were working in an independent practice. And we also have collaborative care agreements where um, members um, sign saying that they'll, they'll follow certain standards in terms of getting patients in and um, a certain amount of time. Um, you know, communicating with specialists and PCPs and uh, clinical quality standards of care. So what are independent practices? You know, frankly, I didn't actually know before I got involved with Health First. I didn't understand the difference. Um, uh, independent practice is a small community-based physician-owned practice. They're not owned by the hospital. It's not an FQHC. So uh, it's, you know, a, a, a doc who opens a practice. Um, some of them um, are just solo, consist of a solo practitioner, um, but many um, have anywhere from between two and 11 physicians. Um, our organization represents 69 physician-owned practices. We estimate we have approximately 80 to 90% of the independent practices as members um, in the state. Um, not all of them, but a good bulk. Um, we also, that uh, represents more than 210 practitioners. Um, this is including MDs and DOs and advanced practice professionals like PAs or physicians assistants and nurse practitioners. Of course, there's also nurses and dietitians and uh, social workers and, and so forth that work at these practices as well. We have 31 primary care sites um, and we estimate that those primary care sites take care of um, over 80,000 Vermonters. Um, and then we, our specialty practices um, practice in 20 different uh, 27 different specialty fields, and we do have member practices across 10 counties. So um, some of the advantages is uh, a small uh, practice is, is tends to be more personal and independent practices um, demonstrate really high quality of care. Um, cost is often is comparatively lower, often dramatically, um, you know, half even. Um, uh, you can usually get into your doctor pretty easily. You call, you have an issue. Um, our practices get, get you right in. You tend to be able to see your um, same doctor over and over rather than being rotated through whoever's, you know, working that day. There's uh, some good continuity there. And it's just people report that the care is just more personal. Um, you know, these are uh, the docs who have taken care of generations of a family. Um, they're known in the community. It's kind of your, your country doc. Um, sort of image, um, you know, these, these doctors are, are an important part of the system and their communities. So I'm going to ask you, I, I think we could skip this slide and, and if you can okay. your priority issues and give us the 10,000 foot level, that okay. would be very helpful. Yep. 
Like um, others have mentioned, um, COVID, you know, is a priority getting through that, just making sure our practices are able to sustain and um, help um, with the COVID pandemic um, in terms of vaccinating Vermonters and so forth. Um, uh, many have mentioned uh, about workforce issues. We too consider that a priority issue. Um, you know, our, our members are retiring, particularly primary care, and they're, you know, not being replaced. Uh, we need to do much more of an effort to recruit primary care. Um, telemedicine is uh, another issue that we're interested uh, along with, you know, the Act 40 stuff, just having it um, be paid at parity so that um, patients continue to have access. Another huge issue for us is, uh, um, like Julie mentioned, um, is addressing the unsustainable situation of, uh, you know, our practices have continually rising costs but their reimbursement rates are flat. Practices are paid by payers, either Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial. And the payer mix varies depending on the practice. The rural practices tend to be highly weighted toward Medicaid, and that's a real problem because the reimbursement for Medicaid is not high enough mm -hmm. to um, cover the cost of caring for these patients. So we have a real issue with that and losing rural primary care practitioners because of that. Um, uh, there's some links to other handouts here uh, talking about this issue. I'm happy to chat more about it, but we definitely have an issue where uh, it's not sustainable. And uh, if we lose these practices, it's, it's, it hurts Vermonters because we're losing a really high cost um, or a low cost, high value option. Yes, thank Another you. Another huge. I'm yep. gonna, I, I think we're going to have to. I, I, I'm sorry, uh, but okay. let's. Um, We'll have to scroll through your last, I think you have another slide or two, um, yeah. because it is now 1024, and I would like to give Josh Green um, his six or seven minutes okay. as well. Thank you for your time. Happy to chat. Please contact me. You will. Me. Don't you worry. Okay. <laughs> and I, I know we have, some, uh, we have some reports coming to us that will definitely affect independent docs in terms of equitable reimbursement. Uh, among others. So um, this is uh, the issues of our rural independent physicians in this state is uh, significant. But we understand. Yes, appreciate Thank you. support. Thank you. All right. Uh, Josh Green, you're here. Um, and I'll, you know, you've got maybe now five to six minutes. So we, pre we, we appreciate your time. Just go right ahead. Thank you very much, Senator Lyons. Um, it's a, an honor and pleasure to speak with you. Um, in speaking with you over the years, I've learned it's uh, best just to ask, uh, what would you like to hear from me uh, specifically? Well, uh, just an introduction to your association and uh, the scope of your interest, and then any specific um, uh, recommendations that you are bringing to us for the legislative session. I think that was the ask that we had sent out. Great, okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Dr. Joshua Green. I am a naturopathic physician. I'm the president of the Vermont Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Um, we are primarily primary care physicians in the state of Vermont, um, offer care in a lot of areas where there are um, underserved populations and like to spend a lot of time uh, with patients, helping them uh, with their diet and with their uh, lifestyle, helping them lose weight, um, you know, helping them get off of uh, medications as their health improves and offering them um, other alternatives to medications when appropriate. Although again, we do uh, prescribe appropriately for conditions, um, but we've been successful in decreasing uh, prescription costs for uh, Vermonters um, over uh, many years. It's been, it's been really great and decreasing the side effects that go with that. Um, regarding uh, legislatively, um, you know, similar to what was brought up um, with the part of the Health First uh, presentation. Um, thank you, Susan. I, really great points for what I did here. I appreciate it. Um, the independent uh, practitioner situation in Vermont is concerning. Um, you know, for the small practices, um, I can tell you that my experience has been that we've not been able to uh, join the, um, the ACO, I'm trying to think what it's called, the main ACO here that, uh, 
has been talked about a lot on the center lines. I'm so sorry. Can you remind me what, what that big ACO is called? Are you talking about One Care? Thank you. Yeah, One Care. So over the last five years, I've tried to be a member of One Care. And um, just as a, as a example of one person, um, they, you know, I was a member for a year or two, but they said, you don't qualify for reimbursement for all the money that we get. Uh, you know, there's like the, the here's the, the money that you save the state and then the money goes to One Care and then they, they give that to all the other practitioners. They wouldn't give it to my office because they said I'm too small to represent statistically to help them with uh, their reimbursements. And I said, well, uh, I get that, but you know, the whole point of those reimbursements is to help all of us uh, uh, live in Vermont because of our low pay. And that combined with the hospital doctors getting paid twice for the same exact service, twice for the same exact service that we do. Um, and arguably as naturopaths, we spend more time with the patients than an average doctor will. So for a, a visit that might be seven minutes with a, you know, an average like MD or DO, we're usually spending between 25 and 30 minutes taking extra time talking about diet and lifestyle, referring them to, you know, physical therapy or a specialist as appropriate, um, as well as doing the, um, you know, the history and the assessment and the physical exam. Well, less physical exams this year with telemedicine, but, uh, you know, physical exams when we can. Um, and so the, the financial disparity is really unfair. And I think we've been asking for years for that financial disparity to get fixed. And I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that so many people in our state's uh, legislature and you know, um, leadership roles understand that there's a disparity, but I'm really exhausted at the fact that nothing has happened. And I'm not saying that anyone's sitting on their butt and not doing anything. I know everyone's working hard and they care but it really has to change. It's really hard to make a living with almost $300,000 in student loans from going to whatever medical school you go to, whether it's naturopathic or MD or DO, and to get paid so crappy. Um, and it, it really just has to change. So there's the health disparity, the, the healthcare disparity issue between the hospital docs and the independent docs, um, which is which is, you know, I would say probably the biggest issue. Um, and then legislatively, you know, changing the term physician to healthcare practitioner um, with all of the caveats you need to put in um, is also really important because unfortunately there are uh, people right now who are restricting anyone who's not a MD or DO from following uh, or being included in, in legislation that, um, that was never intended to exclude us. And there are people in power who are saying, well, because your name isn't there, it's not my job to interpret uh, what the intention of legislators was 20 years ago. So because you're not included, you're not included. And it's in direct contrast to our scope of practice and not just us, but other physicians, uh, nurse anesthetists, nurse practitioners, physician assistants. It's, it's a real hot mess because it's being interpreted uh, very exclusionarily. So those are the biggest issues. And I, I, I'm open to questions, uh, but I can't thank you enough for your time and your ears. Uh, thank you, Josh. And I, I haven't looked, do you have, I think you do have something on our webpage. Do uh, you Did you, uh, can you submit us just a, a quick pro, uh, thumbnail of the information that you provided? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Um, can I get that to you? Uh, uh, you, can, you can send it to Nellie anytime uh, okay. over the next couple of days. That's helpful. Thank you so much. I had patience to get to. Um, really appreciate what all of you do for us in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I'm uh, committee. I, I know that we're at the time where we should be moving on to um, the next topic on Medicaid participation in the all payer model. We will get to that. Um, we're gonna be just about 10 minutes or five minutes late getting there. I did want to invite uh, Helen Laban who is here representing uh, Bi-State Primary Care and some of the FQHCs. So, and Helen, if, if you can give us the, the elevator speech, that would be absolutely terrific because I know we're going to have you back um, another time. 
Sure, Senator Lyons, thank you. And you did most of it. I'm Helen Laban. I'm the director of Vermont Public Policy for Bi-State Primary Care Association. So we represent the federally qualified health centers, Planned Parent Clinics, uh, Planned Parenthood Clinics, the free and referral clinics, and also the area health education centers. I, you know, the big takeaway for what distinguishes our membership is we provide a third of prime, uh, we provide primary care to a third of Vermonters. Uh, so it's a, bi a big portion of that primary care. And, and the federally qualified health centers or the FQHCs in particular are a particular type of primary care provider. Uh, they provide, they are required to provide comprehensive services regardless of a patient's ability to pay. And by comprehensive services, that includes mental health, dental, uh, access to vision services, as well as addressing barriers to care, or what you're, are often called social determinants of health. So you'll probably see me here talking about things like digital divide, access to food as part of healthcare, that whole bucket of needs. Um, and actually, you know what, I'll just stop there. That's what distinguishes us. You have a break to get to and Medicaid to get to, so I won't stand between you and that. And uh, this will not be the last time you see me in any event. So I have sent a link to our source book for those who want details on who our membership um, is and, and what they represent. And so that will be available to review. Yeah, no, I think that the that the promise for reform through the FQHCs and by state is 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 very uh, is very high. And so we will have you come in another time just to talk about the work that's going on. So thank you. Great. Thank you. And thanks for being understanding. Uh, thank you all for being understanding. I do want to take a quick break here. Um, I just want to give you a time. When we stop, we'll come back after five minutes. I, I just wanted to share with the committee why we have done this today. And uh, as we work through healthcare issues and, we, and we're in the state house, we get to meet with all of these people on an individual basis or we're invited to have an individual meeting. I was just trying to frame uh, some of the people that we'll be working with, we'll be seeing, we'll be hearing from going forward. It, it was always a frustration to me in my early years in, in uh, understanding healthcare policy that all these people would just show up all of a sudden and I never knew what, what the bottom line was. So this at least gives you a reference point on our web page and, an, and a bit of an understanding of who the folks are if you haven't had that before and an update if you have. So I apologize if you felt that this was way too much committee, but I think it is really uh, critically important uh, as a beginning. So um, that's all. So let's take five minutes. Nellie, you can put the screen up and uh, Amy and Alicia with apologies for the late start. We'll be back in five minutes.
It's like a ride at the fair, Senator. <laughs> spinning, <laughs> spinning, spinning. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Don't worry. We'll start. We'll, really? start, yes. we'll start slowing down and getting. <laughs> I feel uh, bad for, for the presenters. Well, you know they they are they they get used to it sometimes, and yeah. um, it's important for the for the elevator speech to be ready. So it's yeah. not like we're in the state house. All right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Our Senator Terenzini, Senator Cummings, Senator Hardy, are you there? Ready to begin? Okay. We've got a quorum, more than a quorum. Uh, we have everyone. So um, Alicia and Amy, thank you both for being here. This, um, the topic is very near and dear to all of us, and it will be very helpful to hear um, your information about the all-payer model. So uh, I'm going to turn it right over to you. And I think we have your handout, uh, your information, and you also are going to put it up on the screen. So welcome. Do you? I don't know that you know everyone on the committee. I think there are some new faces this year. Yes, there are. So um, let's go around the table. Uh, we'll start with Josh. Hi, Alicia, Josh Terenzini, Senator from Rutland County. Senator Hooker. Alicia, I'm Cheryl Hooker, also a Senator from Rutland County. Senator Hardy. Hi, Alicia and Amy, I'm Ruth Hardy, a Senator from Addison County. And Senator Cummings. And you're muted, Senator. <laughs> I'm the, I'm the old face, uh, <laughs> Ann Cummings, Senator from Washington County. I'm the really old face, Senator Ginny Lyons, Chittenden County. Uh, thank you both for being here. So um, it's all yours. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Nellie, I'm not sure if you would like to pull up the slides or if you would prefer that we do that, we're happy to do either. Uh, it's probably more smoothly if you did it and you have you're a co-host, you should have the ability to. Great. Let me get myself set up. My apologies. You're okay. And and we do have some time um, in our schedule now. So we'll we'll give you the full half hour and we'll start our next topic just a little bit late. Well, that's, that's kind of legislative time, unfortunately. Ginny, just to let the, the presenters know, I do have to leave at 11 for a finance. Yes, I, I thank you, Senator, for reminding me. All right. Is everyone able to see my screen now? Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for this opportunity to join you today. Um, I'm Alicia Cooper. I'm the Director of Payment Reform, Reimbursement, and Rate Setting for the Department of Vermont Health Access. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Amy Coonrod, who will introduce herself in a moment. Um, we were hoping that we could use this opportunity to give you all a brief introduction to the ACO program that Medicaid has been participating with One Care Vermont in for the last several years. Uh, we're looking at this as a fairly introductory conversation. Uh, and then to the extent you're interested in a, a deeper dive in any of the results that we've seen over the prior years or more of the details about how the model works, we're happy to come back uh, at your convenience. And so hopefully this will be a good connection to the presentations that you heard yesterday from the Director of Healthcare Reform and from One Care Vermont. So to begin, uh, we just wanted to kind of frame the conversation with Vermont's overall goal for the healthcare delivery system, which has been for many years, an integrated system of care where Vermonters are able to get the right care at the right place at the right time, focusing on keeping people healthy rather than treating them when they're sick. Um, transitions of care should be well coordinated across providers and costs of care should be predictable and sustainable. And so with all of this in mind, uh, even before we had an all-payer model agreement, 
the state began exploring what that kind of agreement with the federal government may look like. And so thinking about that big goal uh, of the, the triple aim, improved patient experience of care, improved health of our population, and reduced growth on a per capita basis of healthcare costs, uh, Vermont entered into the all-payer model agreement with CMS to enable ACO-based reform. Um, as you heard yesterday from Ina Backus, this all-payer model agreement is an agreement with CMS in which CMS gives Vermont some additional payment flexibility and some more local control in exchange for the state meeting certain quality, financial, and scale targets and for achieving certain um, alignment across payer programs who are working with ACOs. The agreement also sets forth some planning milestones for any potential uh, future agreement and how we think about the evolution of this model overall. Um, because there's that expectation in the all payer model agreement of alignment across payers, um, there was the expectation that Medicaid specifically would be offering an ACO program that was similar in construct to the Medicare Next Generation ACO program. And so with that, in 2017, the Department of Vermont Health Access launched the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program. Uh, this was designed to be as structurally similar to the Medicare ACO program at that time as possible. And we think about this as our Medicaid component or participation in the all-payer model agreement. We've also used this model as our platform for future ACO-based innovation. So we've been able over the years that we've had this program in place to do some kind of innovative things in the Medicaid space in particular with the hopes that they may represent areas for future alignment across payers as we go along. And we can give some examples of that if you're interested, but at a high level, that's what we've been trying to do with this program. So now I will turn it over to Amy. Amy, would you like to introduce yourself and then take it away? Sure, hi, good morning. Um, so I'm Amy Coonrod and I'm the Director of Operations for ACO Programs at the Department of Vermont Health Access with Alicia. And I will just pick up where she left off. So um, as we've mentioned previously, um, one of the requirements of the all-payer model in Vermont is for Vermont to partner with one or more ACOs, which are then used as the vehicles for payment and delivery system reform and for achieving quality financial and scale targets. Um, an ACO is an umbrella network of providers who come together to assume responsibility for the cost and the quality of care for a defined population of members who are attributed to them. Um, payers like Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial insurers in Vermont like Blue Cross uh, work with One Care Vermont, which is Vermont's sole ACO and from whom you heard yesterday. Um, and providers in One Care Vermont agree to be accountable for the costs and the quality of healthcare for those insurance recipients. Um, provider participation in the ACO program is voluntary um, and providers who participate can benefit from being paid differently than the current fee-for-service arrangement that they have. Um, and they also have access to data and analytics to help them with quality performance and improvement, um, as well as tools and resources and funding to support care delivery and more care coordination. Um, and they also um, have opportunities to leverage shared learnings about best practices from other providers in the ACOs network as well. Next slide, Alicia. Um, the the all-payer model really gives Vermont the flexibility and support to test new ways of paying for and delivering care through working with an ACO um, instead of a, a rigid and prescriptive and top-down approach um, participation in the ACO allows providers to take the lead on reforming the healthcare system through cost containment and quality improvement. Um, the all-payer model also allows Vermont to pay for care in innovative ways through the ACO model, as I think has been mentioned before. Um, changing payment incentives, such as moving away from that pay-for-service construct to a more capitated and predictable payment arrangement with providers 
um, we think is one of the first steps in moderating healthcare spending in the state because it shifts some of the risk of paying for that care to the provider network. Um, the APM also gives Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial programs where key components of the programs like its attribution methodology and set of quality measures um, are aligned. Um, because providers in the ACO are participating in programs with aligned incentives across the different payers, um, this is an opportunity to determine whether ACO-based reform has the potential to transform healthcare in a meaningful way. Um, next slide. Um, this slide's great. So as mentioned before, again, um, Medicaid participates in the APM through our Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program, um, which is our agreement with OneCare. Um, and that program has grown pretty significantly over time. Um, the original contract for the VMNG program was for one year back in 2017, uh, with the possibility of four one-year extensions. Um, Diva and OneCare have exercised the option to extend our contract mm -hmm. for 2018, 2019, 2020, and now for 2021, we're in our fourth extension. Um, the rates that are paid to providers through this contract uh, between us and OneCare um, are renegotiated annually. So those change on an annual basis, depending on the population that's attributed and the providers that are participating in the program. And um, financial reconciliation for the program occurs annually, but it could occur more frequently if needed. Um, the ACO program with Medicaid has grown significantly over the duration of the contract, as I, you can see in this table here, uh, with pro providers and communities joining the program each year. Um, and here we can see that in 2017, there were four health service areas that were participating in the program, and that then increased in 2018, 2019. And in 2020, we achieved something like, we'll call scale, maybe. Um, and so we're seeing, I think we're starting to see in 2021 that the um, uh, numbers are sort of leveling off um, after achieving a, a lot of increase um, in 2020. So I think we're gonna start seeing a stable number of participants and attributed members for the ACO program. Um, next slide, Alicia. Um, so, so far, um, even though we're in the fifth year of the program, we have three years of results um, as of now. Um, as in every performance year, uh, 2019 was our, our latest where we have results. Um, and in 2019, Diva and OneCare agreed on the price of healthcare up front prior to the start of the performance year, which is what we do for every year of the program. Um, and then in 2019, the actual spending for the ACO was more than the expected amount of spending, the agreed upon price. Um, because OneCare now shares financial risk with Medicaid, it had to pay for a portion of this overspend. Um, and so as a result of reconciliation in 2019, OneCare paid uh, $6.7 million back to Diva um, for this overspend. And so absent this risk sharing arrangement with OneCare um, before we had an ACO program like this, Vermont Medicaid would have had to pay the entirety of the amount in excess of the expected price. Um, also notably for the third year in a row, um, ACO participating providers who were paid prospectively that fixed prospective payment um, instead of fee-for-service spent less than expected on the services within their control. And then for two years in a row, in 2018 and 2019, the providers that were still paid fee-for-service, that traditional way of paying for services, um, both within and outside of OneCare's network, spent more than expected. Um, and I think we think this helps to really drive home and highlight how changing financial incentives for providers could really move the needle on the delivery and cost of healthcare in Vermont. And I will throw it back to Alicia. Thank you, Amy. Um, so before we conclude our, our presentation, we did wanna spend a little bit of time talking about how um, from the DIVA perspective, we see some potential benefit to the Medicaid program from this arrangement that we've had with an ACO and that we continue to have in place. Um, the first is that the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program has given Vermont Medicaid more certainty in its budgeting than it would have had in a fee-for-service environment over the last several years. We also have uh, in place in this agreement risk corridors, which essentially um, have providers bearing some financial risk in a way that they had not previously 
uh, and a fee for service arrangement um, that provide both incentives to control costs and also protections for both providers and the Medicaid program when the actual expenditure is different from what we expect. And thinking about sort of the payment predictability that comes from the prospective payments in this model and this risk sharing mechanism working together, um, those two elements can start to build some more system stability over time. Uh, as Amy just mentioned, we've seen some patterns for uh, providers that are being paid prospectively and providers who are still being paid fee for service underneath this model in the first three years that, though not conclusive, uh, signal the potential for changing financial incentives within this model. We've also observed over those first three years for which we have results, uh, incremental improvements in quality performance for our Medicaid members who are attributed to the ACO and changes in the delivery and coordination of care that have come along with One Care's implementation of their care model. And finally, we think that this program gives us the opportunity to continue testing a model of ACO-based reform and to continue improving our methodology for establishing rates to allow some additional year-over-year -year predictability in future. And this is something that we are interested in pursuing um, in the coming years as we think about potential future contract years. And so to conclude, um, we just wanted to note that the Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO program is reinforced by the department's priorities. You may have seen these priorities before, and you may see these in other presentations from DIVA leadership that you see in the coming weeks. Um, but there are three priority areas that the department has, uh, one relating to value-based payments, of which this model is our um, sort of keystone, and one related to performance. And so by implementing the Vermont Medicaid Next Gen program, we uh, are able to focus on Medicaid being a predictable and reliable payer partner. We're also able to focus on continual and incremental programmatic and performance improvements as we make changes year over year. And finally, the program gives us those opportunities to align with other similar payer programs and opportunities to be an innovative leader and hopefully come up with some ideas that other pair programs may want to align with in future. And with that, we will stop presenting and we're happy to take any questions uh, or to come back if you wanna have a, a deeper dive at any point in time in future. Uh, I think we're going to do both. <laughs> so uh, Alicia, maybe take, the, take your slides down and then if we need to go back to a slide, we can do that. But it's easier to uh, see who has a hand up when we're in this format. So thank you. And thanks for that. That was a very, uh, that was a nice over, overview. I appreciate that. Well done. So um, committee questions for Alicia or Amy and, or both. Uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Alicia, uh, you said that the all payer model requires um, Vermont payers to partner with one or more ACOs. We have one ACO and can you explain why? So I think the, the all payer model when originally conceptualized uh, envisioned the potential for multiple ACOs participating. Um, at this point in time, as you mentioned, there is only one ACO in operation in the state of Vermont, although historically there had been some other ACOs. Uh, I think you know, the, the history of, of how ACO composition has changed over the last few years is a, a longer one, and there might be others who are better to speak to it than I am. Um, but I think that you know, should there ever be another ACO, there is still the potential for that ACO to be um, part of the ACO-based reform that's envisioned by the all-payer model currently. Okay. So, so it, it's really a group of providers. So the, the providers would have a patient pool that uh, wouldn't necessarily um, be redundant with other providers and patients. And, and right now, remind us, um, 
are the FQHCs or any of the FQHCs within the ACO? Yes, there are a number of FQHCs that are participating in the One Care Network. Yes, and so originally they had thought about having their own uh, ACO, and that that fell apart for a number of of reasons in the in the early years, and early times. Senator Hooker, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow. No, I'm just I'm I'm just trying to get a handle on how the um, ACO, you know, the like the One Care Group comes about, you know, and you said, Senator Lyons said a group would get together and form their own. Um, so they would apply, um, they look to see if it's financially feasible for them. I mean, I don't know what the, what the process is, I guess. So I, I think one of the things to look at, um, and I'll let Alicia answer that question, but I think one of the things that we can look at is the legislation we passed around the around the ACO and the principles that need to be in place to be an effective ACO, but there are also federal requirements. So Alicia, why don't you um, just answer that question for um, Senator Hooker? Sure, so I think um, thinking about ACOs generally, um, I think that there are, as you mentioned, federal guidelines for ACOs that may want to participate in payer programs, in particular with the Medicare program. Uh, we also have some requirements uh, legislatively um, and in, I think, administrative rule about ACOs and their oversight from the Green Mountain Care Board for those that are participating in programs in the state of Vermont. Um, and then when it comes to participation with the, the Medicaid program, for instance, uh, back in 2016, the Department of Vermont Health Access released a request for proposals for ACOs that might want to participate in this Vermont Medicaid Next Generation ACO arrangement. Um, and that at the time was also not limited to a single ACO. So we welcomed applicants from uh, any ACOs, Vermont-based or otherwise. And uh, through the, the procurement process, one Care Vermont was selected as the apparently successful bidder and the one that we ultimately contracted with. Um, I think, as Amy mentioned, our contract term was a one-year term with four optional one-year extensions. We have now used all of those one-year extensions. And so as the department thinks about um, ACO arrangements in future for 2022 and beyond, we are anticipating doing another open procurement process um, that again could be open to one or more ACOs. Okay, and I, I do have a couple of other questions if I may. Go right ahead. Okay, um, you mentioned that uh, the Medicaid proposal or the Medicaid arrangement gives more certainty uh, and yet we're hearing from providers about the um, inadequate reimbursement now that you know how is that um how is the new program helping to remedy that situation sure. that's a great question um, so i think one of the real benefits that we have through our medicaid next generation aco program and through our partnership with one care vermont is that participating providers um, in particular as one care mentioned yesterday hospitals and some of the larger independent practices have been able to change their revenue structure from fee-for-service reimbursement to prospective payments. Uh, and in the Medicaid program in particular, uh, what we're doing with those prospective payments is essentially saying, you know, you have an agreement with the ACO for how much you're going to be prospectively paid. We will be monitoring over the course of the year the services that are being provided to our Medicaid beneficiaries underneath that prospective payment. But if the prospective payment itself in value is greater than the number of individual services would have added up to on a fee-for-service basis, the provider organization is entitled to retain the funding. And that's, that's the big incentive of changing the payment model. Um, it provides the incentive for um, organizations to be more efficient with the resources that they have. Maybe they don't have the same incentive to do as many tests or x-rays or things like that if they can be focusing on 
prevention and know that they've got the ability then to be um, retaining any funds that are sort of available in excess of what they would have done on a service by service basis. Um, so that's that, a great. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I that's finish up. Go ahead, Alicia. Real benefit of the prospective payment structure that we have in our ACO model. Um, the the and, conversation and, about Medicaid fee for service rates generally, I know, is a is a perennial subject, and you know happy to come back and talk at a different time about how we've been trying to keep our reimbursement methodologies professionalized and updated on a regular basis, recognizing great. that we're often limited by resources. Great. And I, I certainly do support the prospective payment um, system, you know, rather than fee for service. It seems that that's been talked about for a long time and I hope we're moving in the right direction there. I do have a question. It, it brings up a, uh, something that Dr. Green said in our previous group of um, witnesses. He joined, uh, my understanding is that he joined the ACO at the end of the year was not eligible for reimbursement because his practice was too small? So I, I will admit to not being familiar with the specific arrangements that one care might have had with individual providers, and that may be a question better directed to one care. Um, my expectation is that um, a, a naturopath being one of the smaller providers that isn't necessarily um, one that has been sort of transitioned to the prospective payments that One Care has been doing with hospitals and larger independent practices, um, they would have continued to be reimbursed by providers in the usual way throughout the year via fee for service. Um, but it may have been related to uh, some of the additional distributions of funds that One Care does across its network at the end of the year once they know more about their overall financial performance. Thank you. Yeah, it's, and it does, uh, some of your questions, Senator, I mean, they're very, they're excellent questions, you know, uh, but it also uh, moves into the question about how many, the uh, percentage of reimbursement that's going to providers from private versus Medicaid and how many of the patients uh, are, are within the groups that are eligible for uh, all payer and then it also gets into the contracts that are written between providers and private insurers, and then the contracts that are written between the ACO and the providers. So there is a lot there that, um, and, and last year I did have a bill in that would have made some of those contracts more transparent. And I still believe that that is an important issue for us to look at as we look at equitable reimbursement. So. But that, that's not As you say, specific. Senator, it's complicated. It's well, complicated. it is complicated, but I, you know, there are some things that can happen that will uncomplicate it. <laughs> uh, uh, Alicia or Amy, is there any anything else? I, I wanted to ask one quick question uh, and it, as, as provider risk goes up, so in terms of overutilization, perhaps we're reducing that, in a, that, that we see in a fee-for-service world, but what, if any, um, risk is there for the patient? Is there any, uh, the patients can still go in and ask for the care until the cows come home, but so how, how does that work? I think that's, a, that's an excellent question, and I think that's why one of the beneficial structures that we've tried to utilize in the first few years has been that risk sharing. Um, so in, in the example that you just uh, offered, with the risk sharing arrangement, we have providers assuming some financial risk and hopefully being incentivized to make some more efficient choices about the delivery of care so that we don't just keep seeing the cost of healthcare grow and grow and grow over time. Um, but also, at the same time- and, and the quality metrics that are being uh, put in place. So it, it is, it is value-based. And so we can see some clinical improvement over time. So okay. that, yes, that's a great point as well. Okay. Um, but because of the risk sharing arrangement, um, even if the provider risk uh, is sort of exceeded at some point, or there's some expectation that the providers would have to pay 
a payer back for a portion of, of that risk, as we saw in the 2019 performance year. Um, the Medicaid program, as Amy mentioned, is going to continue to pay for any services that are happening above and beyond that risk corridor. So as you mentioned, patients have full freedom of choice of where they receive services, and uh, there isn't any sort of mechanism that would really allow that kind of rationing of care that we might have thought about in more of a, a managing framework. Right. So our capitation is not the extreme capitation. It's kind of middle of the road, which is probably a good thing. Yes. We're still learning. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, um, I don't want to keep you beyond the needs of the committee, but obviously this is the tip of the large iceberg and we will be coming back to the next gen um, it, model and, and looking at what's happening next uh, in a couple of weeks. So we, we would hope that you might be, make yourselves available again. Certainly, we'd be happy Thank to. you very much. Appreciate your time and your patience with us earlier. Um, it's been very helpful. Thank you all Thank for you. the opportunity to join. Have a good day. All right. Terrific. Take, Take care. care. Bye. All right. So um, committee, uh, I think we're, we will keep putting the one care and um, all payer model, our healthcare reform on the table. And as we go forward, we'll be able to find some places for improvement and work together on that. Um, and we're, we're, now we are joined with our next group of folks, and I'm really happy to see that everyone is here with us to look at S42, the bill that we talked about yesterday, seems like 100 years ago, but the bill that establishes the Emergency Service Provider Wellness Commission. And thank you all for being with us and being a little bit patient because we are on legislative time. Uh, so, James Baker is here. Uh, it's good to see you and thank you for being here. Hi, Why Senator don't you Howard. just go right ahead and give us uh, the information that we need to understand how important this bill is. Yeah. Good morning, Senator and committee. Uh, thank you for the yeah. opportunity. Do to you be know here. what I, I do you know everyone on the committee? Um, I think I think I've met um, just about everybody on the committee except for for maybe one or two. Why don't we do that? I, why don't I just, I will just name the committee members in their districts to, for, for purposes of, for everyone uh, and save time. But Senator Cheryl Hooker is here from Rutland County. Senator Ruth Hardy is here from Addison County. Senator Josh Terenzini is here from Rutland County. So we're surrounded by Rutland. And Senator Ann Cummings had to leave for, for another committee meetings, but she is also on the committee with us and she's from Washington County and I'm Senator Lyons from Chittenden County. There we go. Great. I think probably the only uh, person I don't know is Senator uh, Terzini from Rutland County. So it's nice to meet you, sir. So for the record, uh, my name is Jim Baker. I'm the interim commissioner of corrections. And uh, I appreciate this opportunity to come in and talk about S42. Um, the bill that would uh, set up an emergency services provider wellness commission. Um, represent, or Senator, I think the way to do this, if it's okay, um, is just to kind of give some background like I did last year, just for everyone to, to be up to speed how we got to where we are. But I also want to recognize Senator Sears and Campion uh, for their support um, in reintroducing this bill uh, again this year. So we appreciate that support. Um, and, and I want to start out by saying, when, when this idea came together, um, I wasn't in my current role as the Interim Commissioner of Corrections, and I'll walk folks through that. But I do have the blessings and support of uh, Governor Scott on this effort in my, in my role as the Commissioner of Corrections, and I wanted to make sure the committee knew that. Um, just, just walking through the history of this, um, I was not in state government um, back in 2019. Uh, when, when uh, I decided to pull together a group of first responders in June of 2019. I had had the privilege of uh, uh, winning the Con Hogan Award in 2018, um, supported by the Vermont Community Foundation. And uh, I take note of your, your agenda for tomorrow. I believe you have Holly Morehouse coming in. 
um, to testify. And uh, uh, Holly is also a winner of the Con Hogan Award. And uh, I'm deeply appreciative of the work she does. And uh, I was honored to receive that award. What came with that award was a, a very generous stipend from, from the Vermont Community Foundation. And uh, that was in October of 18. And uh, I had some medical issues that kind of slowed me down a little bit in the spring of 18. And uh, I was giving some thought about how I wanted to apply those resources um, that I was given. And I decided that um, I was gonna focus on the wellness of first responders in the state of Vermont. Uh, I have a long history in the interest of first responders being a, a former EMT myself and being a road trooper back in the days when I was with the state police and working with fire departments and EMS squads and other folks that um, I worked side by side at, uh, with at some very tra tragic scenes in, in my career. A lot of death, a lot of sorrow, and a lot of pain amongst families that you would deal with. And uh, I decided that um, I would pull together a group of first responders and start talking about what I saw as the uh, unlevel playing field for first responders who have suffered through traumatic events and couldn't get the same services that I may have got or that some organizations supply their members in the state. And that was in, uh, we got together in June of 2019. And uh, immediately was, I was met with uh, enthusiasm and support from the group representing fire, corrections, EMS, the police, um, across the board that there was a need for this conversation. And at the time I was coming off of um, spending three years working for the International Association of Chiefs of Police in Washington, where one of the projects that I worked on was suicide of police officers and the wellness of police officers. And I had a pretty good view of what was going on, not only across the country, but across the world when it came to police officers committing suicide. But as I started researching this, I realized even back in 2018 and 2019, that there was a significant number of firefighters and a significant number of, of EMS workers that were also committing suicide and taking their own lives. And it really paralleled uh, what we, we know about uh, PTSD and the results of trauma in the military. And, uh, you know, as a side note, I have a child that's served four tours as a Black Hawk pilot in the Middle East and has seen his share of tragedy um, as a result of his work in the military. And so I have that element. Um, but I also, have, I've also been in a situation where I, I went into what I would consider several traumatized organizations. I served for a short period of time as executive director at the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council, training council at the time, now the Vermont Justice Council. Um, as a result of a suicide of a staff member there uh, in, in, uh, in, in the uh, uh, early winter of 2010. And then as, as uh, Senator Hooker knows, I spent three years in Rutland as the police chief in what I consider to be a traumatized organization with a lot of history of trauma that was never dealt with um, as an organization. And um, so I had a real interest in this field. That, that ultimately led to us uh, holding the first ever first responder wellness conference on, uh, on December 9th of 2019, where we organized ourselves to hold that first conference where there was 250 plus first responders and town managers and leaders in, in first responder community who attended. And we had a day long uh, conversation about the needs of first responders. And I want to remind you, this was prior to the pandemic. And uh, the pandemic has brought on a whole nother element of stress and tragedy for first responders that they're dealing with. And um, we know that first responder trauma is challenging. It's uh, trauma, folks, uh, I, I, would, I would submit that probably our country is traumatized right now because of the pandemic. And there's a lot of folks that are traumatized as a result of loss. First responder trauma looks a little bit different. And the reason why it looks a little bit different is that it, it is reoccurring over and over. And uh, first responders uh, are exposed to trauma on a regular basis. And so coming out of that conference in December of 19, um, 
it was a consensus that we would move forward and see if we could get legislation introduced to, to, to uh, bring a commission um, to the forefront to take a look at what's being done in the state, uh, how consistent is it, is there a level, level playing field? So what we heard at the conference was, for example, if you're a volunteer fire service and you're responding to traumatic events, you may not have the same support as the Burlington Fire Department or as the Brattleboro Fire Department. And if you're a town fire department volunteer, you may have a different level of support than if you're a nonprofit fire department not associated with a locality. And so it just drove home the point that we thought it was a good idea uh, to come forward and try to level the playing field. Um, there is a lot of work being done in this space, um, even now with the pandemic. There's been a couple PSAs done, a couple training videos done, urging people to seek out help. And that, that help is, uh, is out there if, if people can find it. And I, I don't, that's the history of how we got to where we are. And um, let, me, let me end this by, and I, and I do have the permission of this individual. I wanna give you one example of what drove me uh, as an individual to decide to bring that group together in, uh, in uh, June of 2019. April 12, 2008, Trooper Kurt Wackenbach is a state trooper in Brattleboro. Uh, on that day around seven o'clock in the morning, he's called at home that uh, there was a, a woman in Wardsboro, Vermont in a mental health crisis. They had dealt with the individual within a couple of days prior to this incident. And I, I'll, I'll fast forward because I want to get to the other committee. I want to get to the other witnesses as well, Senator. But I think this drives home the point of why this is a unique request that is needed. Trooper Wackenbach responded to that area. And when he responded there with other first responders, fire, EMS, overhead management team to learn that this woman had taken her two young children and thrown them into a roaring river. And uh, then jumped in the river herself. Uh, I happened to be the colonel of state police at the time. I was on vacation and because uh, I don't, I don't, you don't forget these kind of phone calls. Uh, I was in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina with my family on vacation uh, when my phone rang that day to tell me what was going on. The mom and the two children perished. Trooper whacking back, another trooper, firefighters, EMS, valiantly tried to get into that rushing water to, to pull out the children and they were unsuccessful. Kurt marshaled down for several years and I would urge you if the committee is so inclined that Kurt would be willing to come in and talk to the committee and tell his story. Kurt, Kurt marshaled down for a couple of years, tells a story of uh, that valiant effort to try to save those children. Um, soaked from head to toe, April, you know what it's like in the spring in Vermont, roaring river, cold, damp out. Uh, he tells a story of going back to the command post soaking wet and, and walking in and seeing the activity of the rescuers trying to figure out what they were going to do next to try to recover these victims and feeling like he had failed. And hardly anyone spoke to him because I'm sure they didn't know what to say. But being in that situation, in his mind, he was a failure. And uh, he soldiered on for three or four year, more years as a trooper until it all started falling apart. And eventually um, he had to leave the profession as a result of his post-traumatic stress syndrome. And if it wasn't for the program that the state police had in, at the time in place, um, Kurt may not have gotten the assistant that he needed to work his way through. And uh, I talked to Kurt often and uh, you know, he gave me permission to talk about this today, but I think it sets the understanding of why this is so important and that um, we, we have these volunteer and paid first responders that are risking their lives, um, especially in the pandemic right now, it's made it worse. I know in my department, I'd be willing to bring some folks in from corrections to talk, facing every day coming to work. Uh, some of them have con contracted the virus. Um, working with individuals that have the virus in a very stressful job to begin with. And now we layer the pandemic on top of it. Staying in hotels and staying away from their families so they don't bring the virus home. And I just think it's a timely time to support the first responders 
and uh, consider this bill. And again, uh, Senator Lyons, I really appreciate you and your committee. Um, as soon as we got to you and said, we're gonna reintroduce the bill, you jumped on it and I appreciate that support. And with that, I'll, I'll open it up to questions. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. Um, the, this testimony is so compelling and we greatly appreciate the work that you have done to get this to us. Uh, just want to say that. So questions committee. All right. Uh, Senator Hooker. Oh, thank you. And thank you, Commissioner. It's good to see you. Um, just a question about the story that you just told. We're talking about these first responders who wouldn't have access to um, the mental health services that they need. Would that trooper not have had access through state? He, he, yes, he did at the time. And, uh, you know, eventually, you know, part, part, of what, part of what the struggle for first responders is, is the stigma of showing weakness. I mean, we're, you know, first responders jobs are to go take care of problems. And um, they responded, you know, and if Kurt was to come in, he'll tell you, he, he responded that day with, his, with, in his mind, failure is not an option. That's not an option. Mm -hmm. And when it happens, um, it's devastating. And uh, you carry that around with you. And again, being in this business 45 years, um, I, I can recount my own stories. Um, but he had, he had access. Part of what the challenge is is the stigma. So in this case, you had volunteer rescue and fire on the scene. Um, we, going back to my role as a colonel at the time, we provided critical incident debriefing to everybody as part of our, our effort at the time inside the state police. And again, the state police's efforts have matured in the last 12, 13 years. So again, uh, they may not have had the same access and that's the point that I'm making is, is that in these situations, sometimes organizations don't have the same access um, or the, the same level of training or understand the significance of what's known as a diffusion on the spot, trying to diffuse, diffuse the situation and getting, get them pointed to the right place for help. I hope that answered your question now. Yes, and part of the charge of this council would be to find ways to overcome the stigma Overcome the stigma, the latest research. There's a lot of work going on nationally, internationally on post-traumatic, um, on how trauma affects people. Look, you know, first responders are not the only one exposed to trauma. The difference is um, it's in their job description. That's what they do. And they can't get away from it, so it's a cumulative. So the commission would look at the latest practices. There's a real need for, for developing further clinicians in the state that are familiar with first responder trauma. Um, there, isn't, there isn't a lot of folks that have that specialty. Um, looking at, um, is, there, is there a need for adjustment in, in laws? And taking a look at that every year and constantly being able to figure out how to raise the bar to support these folks and deliver a report to all of you every year so you know um, what's going on in the field and where, where, the, uh, where, where the holes in the system are. Thank you. Uh, Senator Terenzini. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Uh, Jim, nice to see you. We nice actually did meet, you, we did meet a couple times at some Project Vision meetings and a fundraiser at the Rodrigues, but it's good to see you. You know, um, what, I, I have, you know what? I have to apologize, especially <laughs> on the fundraiser at the Rodrigues. That's, I'm, I'm really sorry. That, no, no uh, problem. I got that. And I good thank, to see you. I thank you for your support that time as well, Senator. You got it. Um, that being said, uh, I'm excited that this is in front of us. I, I also spent uh, nine years on our volunteer fire department in Rutland Town, and this is such a critical piece of the job of any first responder. Uh, more specifically, um, I also have friends that are dispatchers, and we know mm -hmm. that, that uh, dispatchers are the first in line uh, to get the call to hear the tragedy on the other end. Um, and uh, you know, I also wonder what type of services the dispatchers currently receive um, in terms of uh, grief counseling and, and sort of, uh, so would you elaborate a little bit on that, Jim? Sure. And thanks for bringing me around to that, because I, I make this mistake all the time, Senator. When I talk about a, a police department, uh, in my mind, I'm thinking of the dispatch function in there. And uh, sure. I, know, I know Barb Neal's up to speak and uh, she, 
you know, if she was here, she'd be kicking me under the table to remind me that I forgot to say this, right? Um, look, I'm familiar from my days of uh, running a dispatch center. Um, I know of cases where dispatchers have been on the phone uh, when somebody is shot and killed by their, by their aggressor. And uh, they are the first ones on the scene. And they are thought of in this bill, as, you'll, as, you, as you see in the bill, dispatchers are spoken to in the bill and they're a significant part of the folks that are exposed to trauma. So they would be a significant part of the conversation as well. And I do apologize for not bringing that out. Excellent, thank you. All you right, Th thank you. I'm gonna suggest that we move on to, to get testimony from the other folks who are here with us. And, uh, but Commissioner Baker, don't go away, please. And uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm here, Senator. I'll stay. We it. need your we need your expertise in this completely. Um, and I, I will say that my first inclination was to reintroduce the bill, but I I reached out to, to make sure that Senator Sears and Senator Campion were the ones doing it because it was their original um, idea. But I think there's a lot of support for this and we just need to have the information that will help us present it to our Senate colleagues. So thank you. So we have Barb Neal from E911. Um, introduce yourself and give us your testimony. Sure, thank you. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair. And, and thank you, Commissioner Baker for uh, that history his history of the work he's done on this initiative. Um, I attended that 2019 wellness conference that he referred to uh, and was very moved like everyone else who participated or attended by all the experiences that were, that were shared that day. So uh, for the record, I am Barbara Neal, Executive Director of the Vermont Enhanced 911 Board. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about this very important bill. And first I wanna convey that the 911 board is in support of any initiative to enhance the wellness of Vermont's emergency services providers. We agree that this bill is a very good thing. I'm also happy to see that the 911, that 911 call takers and emergency service dispatchers are included in the definition of emergency responders in the bill. Their inclusion is critically important and most appropriate and certainly serves as a validation of the important role Vermont's emergency communications professionals have in this emergency response community. My ask of you is that these communications professionals also be represented on the commission itself. And I propose that language be added that specifies that the executive director of the Enhanced 911 Board or their designee be included in the membership of this commission. And I believe uh, Beth Novotny set, sent over some, some language to be considered in the appropriate location. So adding that will help ensure that emergency communications community in Vermont has a seat and a voice at this very important table. I sent over a fact sheet this morning, a little summary sheet of um, mental and physical health impacts faced by 911 telecommunicators and dispatchers to demonstrate, and it's on your website, I believe, the, to demonstrate the unique and specific or unique and significant wellness risks faced by 911 call takers and emergency dispatchers. Now, I'm not going to go over the entire list um, provided on that summary sheet in the interest of time, but I did want to point out a couple of quick facts to, to demonstrate my point. So according to a 2015 study of 800 911 telecommunicators nationwide, nearly 18 to 25 percent of, of the respondents met criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. That number, the 18 to 25%, is five to six times greater than the general population. It's also two to four times greater than a recent sample of firefighters and elevated but overlaps with a rate compared to a, a recent sample, recent uh, relating back to 2015, 
of police officers. And, and I don't give those numbers to in any way initiate a conversation about comparisons of pain because that is, is not useful. Um, I, I want to demonstrate that the people who are ear wet witnesses to these traumatic events are also significantly impacted uh, by them. Uh, additionally, about 24% of that nationwide sample uh, met the cr criteria for probable major depression, which it compares to about a 7% um, uh, risk in the general population. And it's interesting, that survey of those 800 911 telecommunicators, um, I was aware of it when I was in a training role at the 911 board, and we distributed the link to the survey to all of Vermont, um, certainly all of Vermont's 911 call takers. Um, and so it's very likely that Vermont is represented in those numbers to one extent or another. I don't have a record of who from Vermont participated in the survey, survey but it was made available to them. Um, there are only limited studies about the physical health impacts of 911 telecommunications, um, but in that large nationwide sample, about 53% of telecommunicators reported a, a BMI, body mass index, in the obese range, compared to just about 40% for the general population. And, and I'm going to echo some of what Commissioner Baker said about, you know, why is there, why is there a risk for this in the emergency responder community and specifically in the 911 um, realm unit of that uh, community? The 911 work is uh, marked by a high degree of novelty. Everything is new. There is a significant lack of control, a significant amount of unpredictability and much social evaluation. All of these factors um, are some of the strongest predictors of stress. And high levels of stress, as we all know, over time have these negative uh, impacts on mental and physical health. 911 um, communications professionals and emergency disp dispatchers, like other public safety personnel, are exposed to these duty-related distressing and traumatic events over and over and over. Um, and research has shown that trauma exposure has that cumulative effect over time. And uh, there's more uh, facts and figures on this summary sheet that you might want to review. Um, but one thing also to keep in mind is as next generation 911 technology advances across the nation and here in Vermont, these challenges and, and risks for, uh, uh, for wellness for our emergency communications people are only going to increase. At some point, it, it's not happening now, but at some point in the future, there will be the ability for 911 call takers to transmit pictures or video, perhaps of, of crime scenes or emergency scenes. And so those ear witnesses that I mentioned earlier are going to transition in some cases to eyewitnesses. And that again, brings in a whole nother um, challenge for ensuring their um, wellness needs are being met. And finally, uh, just a little bit of history about uh, me, about my personal history. I've been the executive director of the 911 board for just about six years now, a little shy of six years. And prior to that, I spent 12 years as a training coordinator for Vermont's 911 call takers. And even before that, I know it's hard to believe because I'm only you know 30 or so, but even before that, um, I was a 911 call taker and emergency services dispatcher myself. I share that with you so you will know that I have sat in that chair and I know firsthand the impact that the job has, uh, that that job has on our emergency communications professionals and the importance of including this community in all aspects of wellness initiatives. I thank you again very much for your time and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for being here. And I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to move through our next witnesses and hope that we can 
um, hear from each one of them. If we can't, we may have to uh, have another invitation and that's just the way things happen sometimes. Um, but uh, we have Bob Lucas here from the Vermont uh, State Police. Uh, welcome. And we look forward to your testimony. Well, first of all, thank you all for, for having me today. Uh, obviously, I'll go ahead and get right to it. Um, once again, my name is Lieutenant Bob Lucas, and I am currently the Vermont State Police Wilson uh, Station Commander. I'm also the uh, Members Assistance Team, uh, also known as MAT. Uh, I am the team commander for that. Uh, I came to be uh, the MAT commander in April of 2019, but it really wasn't until later on that year uh, when I learned the true uh, capability of the team and why it really exists. Um, in February of 2020, 2020, I gave testimony uh, on what was then 243, now uh, Senate 242, at which time I depicted uh, an incident that I uh, ran as a MAT team commander. Uh, with your permission, obviously, uh, given the time limits, uh, I will reference this in, uh, in passing. But uh, I just want to go ahead and highlight this once again, just to, because it really highlights how critical um, peer support for all of our uh, first responders in Vermont is not just uh, for, for VSP. Um, in summary, October of 20, uh, 2019, Vermont State Police, along with local fire, uh, EMS, and law enforcement officers responded to a structure fire in North Hero, Vermont. Upon arriving, troopers reported that the structure was fully engulfed. And while two adults had escaped the fire, there were still two children uh, left inside the structure. Troopers and first responders had attempted to make uh, entry to the building numerous times, but fire crews determined that the children were irretrievable at that point and later confirmed that they had been killed in the incident. That evening, uh, our MAT team responded and began uh, quickly meeting or diffusing uh, with our members uh, who had responded. Within that mix, we also recognized uh, the need for other uh, initial first responders to, to receive that same peer support uh, care that, that we were handing out. Um, but at the scene, obviously they didn't have those resources. Uh, at that point, we made uh, the conscious decision to go ahead and offer our team uh, up to those first responders who would not normally fall in our scope uh, of care. Uh, but just to ensure that they were okay, uh, they were in an okay place to, uh, to make it through until their department could coordinate assistance for them. A formal debrief was set up for our road troopers, arson investigators, detectives, dispatchers, and other uh, DPS personnel that responded to the scene. Uh, but also due to the horrific incident, uh, incident uh, we also looked outside that scope uh, at who would normally not necessarily be in invited to our debriefs, such as the sheriffs, the on-call medical examiners, the state's attorney's office, uh, any 911 uh, call takers, et cetera. Um, again, the ones that didn't necessarily have their own support. Uh, due to the volume of firefighters that actually responded to that scene, uh, our MAT team did uh, ensure that plans were being put in place for them to go ahead and receive resources, but due to the volume of, of firefighters that actually did, receive, uh, did, did respond to the scene, we just weren't able to go ahead and, and uh, assist uh, with those members after, after the incident or the initial incident. Uh, many signs of trauma and grief were noted. Uh, many of our troopers, law enforcement and, and other personnel expressed the, the would have, should have, and could have, uh, and blamed themselves for not doing more. Uh, by the end of the debrief session, most of those thoughts were realized uh, with the reality that if they did go back in there, they wouldn't have escaped uh, the fire and uh, we would be grieving their death as well. For those members that uh, were noted to still be struggling with the effects of this horrific event, uh, we assigned one of our, our two uh, on team or on staff clinicians. Uh, and through this process, I'm proud to say that those who are receiving the initial diffusions uh, at the scene, as well as attending uh, the, the, the post event debriefing, all have been able to go ahead and make uh, it, it, through this trauma remain, remaining uh, obviously uh, dedicated to their professions at this point. Um, I feel confident that uh, if several of these responding members did not uh, take the steps outlined by our team, uh, they would not currently be in the law, law, uh, law enforcement profession at this point. Um, and, and obviously things could have been a lot worse. Um, the current Vermont State Police Members Assistance Team Program has 21 active members representing all disciplines. Um, of, our, uh, em of our employees throughout VSP uh, to include sworn and civilian members. Uh, 
Uh, and I will highlight that we have uh, four active 911 call taker and dispatchers uh, represented on our team as well, because again, we also recognize the importance uh, of including them in, in, our, in our sessions, uh, but also recognize that unfortunately they, they have been left out for, for, for some time now. Um, our team, unlike many states uh, or, or many in this state, as well as uh, within the Northeast, have two uh, certified full-time clinicians and a chaplain to utilize. Um, in addition, our MAT team recognizes the need to have uh, embedded members in our special teams, um, such as bomb squad, tactical units, scuba, search and rescue. So we have an additional 14 members uh, trained at the basic level to assist uh, and, and obviously do check-ins with, with their, their close teammates. Um, statistically, again, I'm not gonna go ahead and, and go, too, go too deep into them, but st statistically in 2020, our team documented over 1,900 uh, personal contacts with our members. Uh, over 1,300 of those were what we call classify as one-on-one -on -one sessions, uh, where troopers are sitting down with other troopers or other members and just having those, those uh, intimate conversations, just checking in to make sure that everybody's doing okay. Uh, these total, this total of 1,900 contacts is more than uh, what we did both in uh, 2019 and 2018 combined. Um, and this doubling down effort really was not uh, by chance. It was a calculated move by our team to ensure that our families uh, are getting, our, our families and obviously members are getting uh, what they need for resources while they face not only the day-to-day -day pressures associated with doing our job, but the pressures uh, like that have been highlighted through COVID-19 restrictions and illness, uh, significant budgetary constraints within the department, police reform, uh, societal unrest, Central retirement system reform, and obviously the national and regionally uh, regional discussion of uh, um, defunding the police. Uh, any one of these certainly would be enough to go ahead and concern our team, but combining them all, it really creates a perfect storm uh, for a person to experience significant and catastrophic emotional stress. Um, it is said that one in five law enforcement officers uh, deals with some type of PTSD. Uh, it's known that um, suicide is on, uh, on, on a fast track. Uh, 17 out of 100,000 law enforcement officers um, will commit uh, suicide. Um, same for, the, for, for fire safety. Uh, they're just a little bit higher, roughly around 18 per 100,000. Uh, and again, that's in the US. And while we don't necessarily have the 2020 data, in 2019, close to 250 law enforcement officers committed suicide. And that's really noted to, to be more than any in the line of death uh, response reported. Um, my job as, as the Vermont State Police Station Commander is to ensure that 20, uh, 21 of my troopers uh, have what they need and obviously they go home at night. My job as the Vermont State Police Members Assistance Commander uh, is to not only take care of my 21 troopers, but also to ensure that the 300 uh, troopers, dispatchers, civilians, as well as their family members really um, make it to retirement and enjoy a happy life uh, and after the service to our state. I went to the police academy because I wanted to help people in Vermont. And I'm proud to say that uh, through the members assistance program, I now get to help the people that uh, I work with just as much. The Vermont State Police Members Assistance Program is fortunate to have that top-down support uh, from our command staff, breaking down those stereotypes and, and stigmas that are associated with seeking mental health uh, help. Um, unfortunately, many of our sister agencies and other uh, first responders, such as fire, EMS, uh, within, our, within our state don't necessarily have the same resources as we do. Um, in summary, uh, folks, I'd like to thank you again for, for allowing me to go ahead and testify. And I believe that S42 really steps uh, is a step in the right direction uh, to collectively get all our first responders the need that they help. Um, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions for you at this point, from you at this point. Thank you, Lieutenant Lucas. Uh, we all very much appreciate your being here. And any, any of the testimony that you have that you can uh, send to us in writing uh, is very helpful. In particular, the data that you have um, it, it sounds, sounds important to us. So I'm going to move right along to uh, Peter Lynch. And then we're going to have uh, Senator Hardy does have a question. And Chris Loris, I know that we tried to get you on the agenda for today. It was a, a late entry. I com completely apologize. But I think we'll, if we can, we'll ask you to come back sometime next week when we uh, take this up again. And how, how does that work for you? 
Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm uh, at your disposal. It's, I appreciate it very much. Lawyer. It's good to see you again. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Ter terrific. All right. So um, we'll go to Peter Lynch and you can introduce yourself and give your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all for giving me the opportunity to speak about a committee uh, of this magnitude for the help of responders in terms of uh, wellness. My name is Peter Lynch. I'm the Chief of Fire Service Training for the Vermont Fire Academy. I was an active firefighter for 35 years and close to 20 of those years, I was also an EMT. During those years, I had an opportunity to watch emergency service evolve uh, in so many ways. And I'm very, very pleased that we're not uh, talking about the critical need for wellness of our responders. You folks probably heard on the news and Colonel Baker alluded to and Lieutenant Lu Lucas alluded to incidents that, that come across the news such as the horrific house fire in Grand Isle County where two young children died and they were the, they were the children of fire and EMS workers. And Colonel, the Colonel talked about the two children that died as a result of their mother throwing them into the brook and the police officers desperately trying to save them and risking their own lives. In fact, almost losing their own lives in the water trying to save those children. Or about the man in Chittenden County who stole a car and drove it down the highway the wrong way, causing multiple car accidents, killing several people and emergency responders work feverishly to keep those folks alive. Today, I'd like to talk about four events that you probably have not heard about, and they were in my area and they involve firefighters. These fires are, firefighters were career and volunteers. They were all successful business people and all have great families. The first is about a volunteer firefighter who was on the department for less than one year and responded to a motor vehicle accident on Memorial Day weekend. The accident was very graphic and involved an extrication of a teenager that was alive, but in very rough shape. The extrication was messy and it took quite some time to complete. That fire, firefighter was prepared from a technical standpoint to do the job and did it very, very well that day. However, there was no mechanism to deal with such a horrific or stressful situation and as a result, the firefighter walked away from the emergency services, never to return. The second is about a decorated firefighter with a long career in the fire service. This person endured years of bad events, including performing CPR on an, on an accidental self-hanging of a baby from a bedroom curtain, as well as the long extrication of two people in a car that were the, the car, um, flipped upside down on a tree stump. Both victims were very much alive at the beginning and the length, lengthy extrication, one did not survive. The firefighter, that firefighter initially received some help for those events, but it was not enough and perhaps not um, always um, prepared by the correctly trained resources. That firefighter also left the emergency service due to his emotional injuries. The other two are funerals that I went to lately in my area for longtime volunteer firefighters who both chose to take their own lives. In both circumstances, those people were hardworking, respected members of the community who responded day and night to help their neighbors. There are no statistics, statistics currently that show that their deaths were a direct result of an emergency scene incident. However, the men and women of the fire service that work side by side as volunteers with those two people can tell stories of awful emergency scenes that those two firefighters were at. These are four examples of bad outcomes and I could share many more horrible incidents with very, very good outcomes as a result of solid pre-incident education and proper post-incident care. Folks, the Vermont Fire Service has 5,000 firefighters of which most are volunteer. The access to appropriate pre-incident education and post-incident aid is limited or in some cases just not available. 
In many cases, small groups are successfully addressing the wellness needs of the response community. However, this is a fragmented effort and to no fault of their own, uh, they fall short of effectively helping everyone, including the four people that I just spoke about. The formation of a committee to ultimately help Vermont's responders perform at a high level in an incredibly stressful situation is a huge step. I very much encourage you guys to support this bill and I'm grateful for your time today. Madam Chair, I'm happy to stay on and answer any questions that you may have of me. And I thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all. This is, um, as it was the last time we listened to some of the testimony, it is extremely compelling. And um, we greatly appreciate your being here and, and helping us understand the need for the bill. Uh, and I just, I will ask one question and then Senator Hardy has a question. And the question is, it, should we expand the committee to include the executive director of the E911? Senator, we, I would support that for sure. Okay. Um, you know, they were included in the language and I think it would be important that um, <clears throat> Barb represent that profession that has such an impact on first responder community. We're, we're trying to get z to Z and the number of members, <laughs> and we're now at X. So we're close. <laughs> I, I, I know it's a big, I know it's a big group. Um, we like it. We, we love the big group. Uh, un, it, I think it's, out, mm -hmm. it's outstanding. Uh, Senator Hardy had a question for all of you here with us today. Yes, thank you, Senator Lyons. And I apologize, I'm going to ask my question or say some comments, and then I have a hard stop. I have a parent teacher conference that I have to get to. Um, so I'm just going to throw this out there. You don't need to necessarily respond, but if any of you have thoughts that you want to share with me, please call or email. Um, I, I'm ha ha very supportive of this legislation. I voted for it last year on the floor, and I'm happy to be able to work on it now as a member of this committee. Um, and in looking at the bill, I do see a few holes. And so I, you know, wanted to try to um, get your response to those. Um, and one is um, definitely um, the the issue that Ms. Neal brought up. And it, um, and then the other th a couple are that um, all of you in your testimony mentioned family members. Um, I um, am not a first responder, but many of my friends are first responders. And I am sorry, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to get a little emotional, but I'm going to try to be fast and uh, not cry. Um, the And I've seen the effect of the trauma on family members. And um, that seems to not be mentioned specifically, Bill. And I know that unrealized trauma um, among uh, first responders has an incredibly huge impact on their families and can over a very long period of time. So I am interested in adding some language that would specifically um, call out and help family members um, with the trauma. Um, the second, and this relates to Barb Neal's um, uh, testimony, is that um, I think probably most E91 responders, I'm going to guess, I don't know for sure, are women. And um, there are um, obviously first responders among all of these agencies who are women, but they are probably in the minority. Um, and so I would really like to see something specific. Women deal with trauma differently than men do. Um, they experience it differently, different things traumatized women versus men. Um, and I, I think it's important to um, make sure there's a, spe a specific language that um, addresses the, the unique needs that women have when um, dealing with trauma. Um, because I think that may get forgotten in a male dominated world. Um, and finally, and similarly, is the trauma that may be experienced um, by first responders of color. Um, uh, I think this is in particularly important because uh, 
in our state, there probably aren't very many first responders of color, but they also may experience trauma differently. They may have different examples of trauma um, and racism that they experience as first responders. And I think it's really important that we um, have a specific language that also addresses their needs. So those are the three things that I saw families, women, and uh, first responders of color I would love to see, um, you know, maybe we can get to Z um, if we include all of them. Um, uh, so that's what I will be talking about, but I really, really appreciate it. And I have lots of stories about my own experiences with this issues, and I'm sure we all do on some level. So I, I really appreciate um, you all coming, and I'm sorry that I have to leave to go to this parent-child conference, so I can't hear your responses, but please, be in touch with me if you have anything specific on any of those issues. So what I'm what I'm going to suggest is because our time is up, and that is that this is a the question is a good question, uh, and I think uh, the language currently in the bill is is general, but I think uh, it would be very helpful. I think perhaps through Commissioner Baker to um, communicate with uh, Elizabeth Novotny and Katie. We'll get that information to. Katie McClinn and and your your um, your response and possible uh, amendment to the bill. So it's not something we have to discuss at this point, but I'm sure it's, it hasn't escaped you. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back with some suggestions, yeah, uh, yeah. Senator. It, all, okay. all of that was part of why we think a commission is so important. Yeah, take a look at what Senator Arden was talking about. Yeah, and I okay. Think, um, We'll, yeah, we'll come, sure. back, with, it, it, we'll come it, back with some suggestions for you. Good, I, and it may be a balance of who's on the commission, but uh, that that's very helpful. And uh, again, thank you all for being here today. Uh, this is the, we, we haven't finished with the bill, but my goal is to fast track it as much as possible so that we can get it over to the other body. We don't need to... Um, prolong your agony on this because I know it's been a long haul I'm trying to get the bill through so thank you again and uh, Chris Loris thank you for being here and being patient and we will uh, Nelly will be in touch again to sign you up for testimony Roger that all right thank you all um, committee we are uh, we finished for the day thank you for persevering we'll try to put some break time in uh, next time so